Welcome back to our journey through the fascinating world of that time I got reincarnated as a Slime's Light novel. Let's continue from the last part where we left. Masayuki Anjo, known as a hero, found himself in a strange world one day after school. While walking with his friends, he saw a stunning woman with blue hair, but when he turned back, he was in an unfamiliar place. Confused and unable to contact anyone, he stood frozen, wondering what had happened. Sitting by a fountain in a town square, Masayuki pondered his situation. He had calmed down since realizing he couldn't do anything about it and wondered how he ended up there. Reflecting on the woman he saw before the strange event, he found her suspicious because nobody else seemed to notice her. Feeling hungry and alone, he wished someone would explain what was happening, like in the web novels he enjoyed. Despite the bizarre circumstances, Masayuki remained relatively composed. He thought about his life back home, being a 16-year-old high school student with a unique appearance and a passion for manga and anime, which he kept hidden from his classmates. This perhaps explained why he wasn't panicking too much about his current situation. Checking his uniform and bag, Masayuki found only a small amount of money, his phone, and a magazine. He regretted not being more prepared for the situation. His disaster kit at home would have been helpful, containing essentials like a Swiss army knife. Feeling hungry and lost in a world where he couldn't understand the language, Masayuki realized survival was his top priority. He decided to try negotiating for food or seek help from a public institution. But first, he needed to find something to eat, even if it meant facing challenges due to the language barrier. Not thrilled with the idea but desperate, Masayuki considered looking for food scraps. He found himself in front of a restaurant guided by its aroma. Facing the language barrier, he wished for communication assistance like in the Izekai stories he had seen. As he approached the restaurant door, it suddenly swung open, and a scared girl ran into his arms. Unable to understand her language, Masayuki could only smile vaguely. To his surprise, the girl blushed and clung to him. However, their moment was interrupted by a large, intimidating man approaching them, making Masayuki fear for his safety given the man's size and demeanor. Feeling trapped with the girl still clinging to him, Masayuki considered fleeing, but hesitated. Just as he thought it was all over, a strange voice whispered in his ear, offering him a unique skill called Chosen One. Unsure, but intrigued, Masayuki accepted, unlocking language skills and other abilities. Suddenly understanding the giant's words, Masayuki realized the power of his new skill. Before he could react, the girl in his arms spoke up, potentially changing the course of the situation. As the tension escalated, Masayuki found himself in a perilous situation, facing off against the powerful Jinrai, the Mad Wolf. Surrounded by onlookers, Masayuki realized he was in serious trouble. Despite the encouragement of the crowd, Masayuki knew he was outmatched. He hoped for help from the guild, but with no assistance in sight, he felt overwhelmed. Despite his confusion and fear, Masayuki understood that he had unknowingly involved himself in a dangerous situation by agreeing to help the girl, Kacha, and now he had to face the consequences alone. Masayuki wasn't ready for the impending fight, but he decided to act tough to buy some time. Despite his bluffing, fear crept in as he faced off against the formidable Jinrai. Regret flooded Masayuki's mind as he realized he was surrounded and had no clear escape route. Attempting to push Kacha away to create space only worsened his situation. With no other options, Masayuki planned to use his chewing gum as a distraction to flee. Suddenly, Masayuki felt a surge of courage, unlocking new abilities from his unique skill, the Chosen One, giving him a glimmer of hope in the dire situation. Despite his attempts to flee, Masayuki's inner voice was ignored a strange power surge through him. Confused and overwhelmed, he decided to ignore the newfound abilities he had unlocked. As Jinrai charged the team, Masaoki braced for impact, only to find himself miraculously unscathed as Jinrai lay unconscious on the ground. Bewildered by what had just happened, Masaoki could only stare in disbelief at his fallen opponent. Confused by his sudden victory, Masayuki was surrounded by cheering onlookers who marveled at his unexpected triumph. Unbeknownst to Masayuki, his newly unlocked abilities, granted by his chosen one skill, had turned the tide of the fight in his favor. With heroic aura, freezing enemies in awe, heroic compensation, granting him luck in battle, heroic charm, inspiring bravery in others, and heroic action, guiding his path to becoming a champion, then he found himself propelled into a realm of extraordinary powers. While he remained oblivious to the true extent of his abilities, the crowd's admiration and praise signaled the beginning of his journey as a remarkable hero. Jinrai, who used to be the tough guy in town, couldn't believe that Masayuki had beaten him with hidden strength. Despite Masayuki not knowing about his new powers, everyone thought of him as a hero. Even though he said he wasn't, 
The people were convinced he was their savior. Jinrai, respecting Masaoki's strength, bowed to him, thinking he was a legendary hero. But Masaoki's protests didn't change anyone's mind. The crowd got even more excited, believing they had found a true hero. Jinrai, known as the Mad Wolf, in town, humbly asked Masaoki, whom he believed to be a hero, to let him join his side. Despite Masaoki's protests, Jinrai insisted on calling him a hero and asked for his name. Feeling overwhelmed, Masayuki introduced himself and decided to go along with Jinrai's misconception to benefit from his assistance and maybe get a free meal. Jinrai, unaware of Masayuki's protests, whispered to him, acknowledging him as a hero. Masayuki saw an opportunity in this misunderstanding and stopped denying being a hero, unknowingly giving rise to the legend of Lightspeed Masayuki the Hero. In a short time, Masaoki was taken by representatives from the Free Guild to the capital of the Kingdom of Inglesia, where he met Yuki Kagerzaka. Yuki, who had been in this world for almost 10 years, older in age, but still youthful in appearance, empathized with Masayuki's situation. After discussing with Yuki, Masayuki decided to become an adventurer, with Jinrai as his companion. Yuki assured Masayuki that learning the language through magic made things easier, though reading and writing required traditional methods. Then Yuki introduced Masayuki to potential companions for his adventures. Masayuki remembered Bernie, another person from Earth whom Yuki had helped adjust to this world using magic. Bernie had become an adventurer and was now looking for party members, making Masayuki and Jinrai ideal candidates. So, they formed a three-person team for adventuring, with Masayuki quickly becoming skilled at the job. Within half a year, they were known as Team Lightspeed, gaining legendary status. Jinrai was ranked C+, but was actually more skilled, while Bernie's magic complemented Jinrai's strength. Masayuki, despite being a casual Kindle learner, benefited greatly from his chosen one skill, making his attacks critical and boosting his companion's abilities. All praise and recognition were directed at Masayuki, earning him the nickname Lightspeed Masayuki. His involvement in the battle tournament further fueled his legend, with spectators attributing his victories to a fictional lightspeed attack. Despite feeling uneasy about it, Masayuki couldn't control the skill and decided to embrace the role of a hero to meet people's expectations. By now, a fourth member, Juwu, joined Masayuki's group. Initially suspicious of him, then she became a crucial member due to her powerful healing magic. Together, they continued their rapid progress, with Masayuki becoming an A-level adventurer and remaining undefeated in battle tournaments. Despite growing accustomed to being hailed as a hero, Masayuki still harbored doubts about himself. As his eventful year unfolded, he faced a significant turning point in his life, unsure of what lay ahead. This time, it was Yuki who called the shots for Team Lightspeed. They were tasked with investigating a slave market recently discovered in Balasia, a risky assignment with potential involvement from the kingdom itself. Yuki, unable to refuse due to a sponsor's request, requested Masayuki's team to act as a distraction, while an investigation team gathered evidence. Masayuki saw the plan as straightforward with their reputation ensuring entry into Balasia. Jinrai, no more refined since his defeat, eagerly embraced the mission, fueled by a desire for justice. At Jinrai's insistence, Masayuki agreed to help combat the slavery problem in Balasia due to his formidable strength. Bernie, an otherworlder with his own unique skill, respected Masayuki despite being resistant to his chosen one ability. Masayuki valued Bernie's impartial perspective, often seeking his advice. Jiwu, displaying unwavering faith in Masayuki's leadership, joined the cause without hesitation, making their decision unanimous. As they attended a noble board in Balasia, Masayuki found himself face to face with the grim reality of the slave market. Feeling overwhelmed, he stumbled upon Breebird the Earl guiding him, who expressed surprise at Masayuki's unexpected prowess as a hero. Confused and taken aback by the sudden turn of events, Masayuki found himself accused of madness and framed for an attack by Earl Breebird's assailant. Jinrai, Masayuki's companion, swiftly engaged the soldiers who rushed in, showcasing his remarkable combat skills. Meanwhile, Marquis Gosu, the one behind the attack on Breber, confronted Masayuki, confident that his authority would sway the situation in his favor. As Masayuki observed the unfolding chaos, he remained calm, knowing that his chosen one ability often turned situations to his advantage, making him appear as the hero regardless of the circumstances. As the commotion drew more onlookers, including nobles and foreign guests, Earl Breber regained consciousness thanks to Jiwu's healing magic. Jinrai, addressing Breber, pressured him to confess to his involvement in the slave trade threatening dire consequences if he didn't comply. Breber, realizing the severity of the situation, chose to confess. Just then, the king of Balasia arrived, 
bringing swift resolution to the chaos. Subsequently, military police uncovered evidence of a larger slave trading operation led by Marquis Gosel, shucking the king and prompting him to take decisive action against the criminal organization. Orthrus, a powerful criminal organization, was not just involved in slave trading, but also dealt in various illicit activities such as weapons, drugs, and magic items. Valacious King sought the assistance of the Free Guild, and naturally, Masauki's team Lightspeed was enlisted as well. With over 2,000 adventurers mobilized, including Masayuki's rank party, they swiftly eradicated Orthrus from the nation. Masayuki's mere presence enhanced the group's performance, earning him fame across Ingolja and even reaching the Western nations. However, the operation left behind a new problem. What to do with the freed slaves, particularly the elves who wished to return to the forest of Jora. Returning them home could provoke the demon Lord Rimuru, who recently acquired jurisdiction over the forest, leading to potential geopolitical complications for Belisha. Then Belisha's king saw Masayuki with pitiful eyes. Then he agreed to help with the elves for this situation, thinking it wouldn't be a big deal to take them to Tempest. However, rumors quickly spread that Masayuki was off to slay a demon lord, fueled by the misunderstanding. Despite the chatter, Masayuki remained unperturbed, confident that things would work out fine as they always did. Communicating with Yuki through a magical link, Masayuki reassured him, while Jinrai expressed confidence in Masayuki's abilities. Masayuki thought for a moment as Bernie and Jinrai discussed facing Ramiru. He acknowledged that if Inata, whom Yuki praised highly, couldn't defeat Ramiru, and maybe he was tougher than he initially thought. Bernie cautioned against rushing into a fight, suggesting they observe Rimuru's actions first. Masayuki agreed, realizing the importance of proceeding carefully. With his companion's support, he felt confident they could overcome any challenge. As they prepared to journey to Tempest, Masayuki remained optimistic about the outcome. Back to the Tempest. After numerous royal audiences, the town was bustling with human guests from all over the world. Delegations and merchants flocked in, some without formal invites, attracted by rumors of the town's appeal. Previous visitors proudly showed newcomers around, while even nobles marveled at the sights. Though the town aimed to become a tourist hub, it could only accommodate a limited number of nobles and commoners. To ensure security and comfort, nobles were given priority in luxury inns, while the merchant class received meticulous attention from Miramail, a reliable figure in hospitality. With Miramail handling lodging, Rimuru focused on attending to the most important visitors, confident in the town's promising start. In a meeting hall, Shuna and Xian were busy with preparations, ensuring everything was set for the large crowd. Meanwhile, Gabel and Kuro were conducting final checks on exhibits. Since Rimuru wasn't dealing with monsters, he didn't feel the need to assert dominance. Dressed formally in human form, he interacted with the nobility from the Western nations including the King of Boomund, who expressed gratitude for Rimuru's help in political matters. Despite the king's friendly demeanor, Rimuru sensed his underlying motives, understanding that their nation's fates were intertwined for mutual benefit. The king's insistence on not needing further thanks hinted at his shrewd nature, reminding Rimuru of the importance of political alliances and self-interest in diplomacy. Rimuru expressed gratitude to the king for trusting them, emphasizing the importance of gratitude in conversations. The king, in turn, teased Rimuru about his demeanor, acknowledging the trouble caused by Viscount Kazak and expressing relief at Rimuru's ability to resolve the situation. Despite Kazak's action staining Blueman's reputation, Rimuru understood he was just a pawn in a larger scheme and didn't pursue further punishment. The king, recognizing Kazak's ties to criminal gangs and his abandonment of noble duties, stripped him of his titles and exiled him from Blumand. Rimuru accepted the decision, considering it fair given the severity of Kazak's crimes, though he sympathized with the challenges Kazak would face in rebuilding his life. Okay, I accept the punishment, Rimuru said, relieved that the matter was resolved. The king confirmed their ongoing treaty, expressing hopes for continued partnership. After a firm handshake, they moved on to discuss Rimuru's grand operation plans. The king, eager to hear more, indicated his willingness to participate directly. Rimuru outlined the basic idea of turning Blumund into a distribution hub, which excited the king and queen. Rimuru noted the need for the founder's festival to succeed first, and the queen emphasized the importance of consensus among nations. Pleased with the proposal, the royal couple bid farewell, expressing excitement for the festival and their stay in Tempest. Rimuru appreciated their straightforwardness, finding it easier to deal with them. The day after meeting with Blumen's royal couple, Rimuru welcomed Gezel, the dwarven king, who arrived tired from his carriage journey. Gezel helped himself to tea and snacks, even snatching the last donut from Rimuru. 
Despite this, Gezel dismissed Rimuru's concern, implying he had much to learn. He explained the challenges of his official visit, which required a large entourage due to security and the need to showcase Dwargan's military might. After Gezel complained about the challenges of his journey, Rimuru realized the need for better transportation systems in their world. Despite planning wide highways, long-distance travel for nobles remained difficult due to various issues like traffic jams and vehicle breakdowns. Reflecting on Gezel's experience, Rimuru acknowledged the need for better planning in the future. Gezel, however, arrived in person because he suspected Rimuru of having ulterior motives and wanted to see for himself. Gezel also questioned Rimuru about his battle with Inata Sakaguchi, expressing doubt about the official outcome and implying he believed Rimuru emerged victorious. Then Rimuru explained to Gezel how he emerged victorious against Inata, urging him to keep it quiet for the time being. Gezel, visibly surprised, admitted Inata's formidable strength, acknowledging he'd struggle against her himself. As a hero king, Gezel relied on his network of spies to assess Inata's abilities, concluding he'd be at a disadvantage in a direct confrontation. Rimuru attributed his success partly to luck and partly to his skills, particularly Raphael, without whom he believed he would have lost. Gezel, while somewhat exasperated, conceded the importance of Rimuru's skills in battle. Transitioning to a different subject, Gezel questioned Rimuru about the sudden change in the Western Holy Church's stance and suspected Rimuru's involvement in the matter. After hearing that, Rimuru's memory was jogged by Gezel's outburst, recalling his suggestion to Inata about involving the Dwarven Kingdom due to their long-standing neutrality. However, Rimuru hadn't sought Gezel's permission for this, assuming it unnecessary, and was now playing dumb to avoid confrontation. He speculated that his recent reconciliation with Inata might have prompted the Western Holy Church's outreach to Gezel. Feeling uneasy under Gezel's scrutiny, Rimuru wished he were in slime form to avoid sweating. He realized Gezel was using a skill called Read Thought, which explained Gezel's keen insights and his tendency to be one step ahead in their interactions. Rimuru realized that his evolution into Raphael helped him identify Gazel's use of the Read Thought skill. Though relieved it wasn't always active, Rimuru worried about the information Gazel might have gleaned. Gazel teased Rimuru about blocking his skill, suspecting Rimuru of nefarious thoughts, and pressured him to confess the details of his conversation with Inata. After Rimuru shared insights about the Seven Days Clergy and Lubelius, Gazel decided to accept the church's request. Despite initial frustration, Gazel relented, focusing on enjoying the festival. Rimuru arranged for discussions between Gezel and Hinata after the festival, acknowledging the need for direct dialogue to resolve matters. With that settled, Gezel departed, and Rimuru felt relieved that the situation had been diffused, anticipating future negotiations between the parties involved. The morning had arrived, three days since Diablo's return. Yon's group had joined them just in time for the pre-opening feast. That evening, with the festival starting the next day, in the meeting hall, Yon and his advisor sat across from Rimuru. Yon, still his bold self, proudly declared his new status as royalty, thanks to Rimuru's support. Rimuru thanked him for his hard work, and Yon expressed his commitment to Rimuru's goals, hoping for continued support. With Diablo's influence, Yon had ascended to the throne of the newly named kingdom, Faminus, symbolizing its rebirth. Muron and Grusif, Yon's trusted companions, were present, with Muron introducing herself as Yon's wife. Rimuru admired Muron's graceful curtsy, noting her elegance. He seemed to fit perfectly into the role of Queen, Muron, remarked Rimuru acknowledging her grace. Yon proudly agreed admitting his own lack of education compared to her. Muron reflected on her past experiences, shaped by Clayman's emphasis on etiquette, which unexpectedly prepared her for her current role. Yom shared his struggles with ruling, including managing nobles and factions, while Raisin, their magic expert, handled post-Civil War matters. Edmaris, now an advisor, aided Yom in navigating politics. Brusith, reluctantly appointed head of the Night Corps, found himself unable to refuse after Muron's plea, despite his initial reluctance. Rimuru observed, concerned but silent, as Grusif accepted his new responsibilities, still considering himself part of Carolyn's warrior alliance for the time being. Then Yom and Grusith started to banter, but interrupted by a young boy named Edgar, son of the previous king, who scolded them for their rudeness towards Rimuru. Despite his age, Edgar was mature and responsible, embarrassed by their antics but accustomed to their behavior. Rimuru suggested they continue their conversation later, as they were all tired from the journey. As a gesture of gratitude for Yon keeping his promise, Rimuru presented him with a certificate for giving the remaining reparations owed, much to Edgar's astonishment. Yon, 
unaware of the implications, handed it to Edgar, who understood its significance. With the mission accomplished, the reparations were unnecessary. Yon's reputation was enhanced by Rimuru's gesture, solidifying his standing as a fair ruler. With the discussions concluded, Yon's group left the meeting hall, taking a stunned Edgar with them. The day had eased up a bit, allowing Rimuru some free time. Keeping his promise, he decided to head to Ingolja to fetch Yuki and the kids from school, ensuring they didn't miss out on the festival fun. After reached the Ingolja, walking through the streets brought back memories, calming his mind. He couldn't resist stopping by the free guild headquarters, where only high-ranking adventurers were allowed. As he entered, he felt the scrutiny of the tough-looking adventurers, some of whom were curious about his presence, noting his unfamiliarity and appearance. Nonetheless, the familiar surroundings brought him comfort and joy. Then he went to Adventure Guild, but upon his arrival there are some murmurs. The murmurs around Rimuru weren't exactly comforting. It seemed like he was being forgotten in less than a year. But then he realized he wasn't wearing his usual mask anymore. With full control over his aura, he opted for a simpler appearance, relying on his old adventurer's attire. Shuna had crafted an extravagant demon lord outfit for official occasions, but it was unnecessary now. Rimuru approached the reception desk, only to be stopped by Grass, who insisted on proper introductions. Despite recognizing Grass from before, Rimuru had to remind him of their past encounters. It was strange that Grass didn't recognize him by his voice alone, considering they had interacted previously. Um, weren't you kinda smaller last time? Grass stammered in confusion upon hearing Rimuru's name. Despite all pranking Rimuru, Grass respected him for his abilities, as adventuring was primarily based on meritocracy. Rimuru's growth since the last encounter seemed to convince Grass, who then praised Rimuru's appearance and expressed his admiration. Grass explained that part of his job involved educating new adventurers and keeping brash newcomers in check, which was why he often frequented the headquarters during his downtime. Rimuru realized that the other adventurers in the group were also there for similar reasons. Feeling a bit embarrassed by the attention on his appearance, Rimuru decided to put on his mask to avoid further discussion about it, leaving the adventurers slightly disappointed. After exchanging pleasantries, Rimuru caught up with Yuuki at the Adventurers Guild. Yuki acknowledged Rimuru's eventful experiences, understanding the challenges he faced with Inata and the Pharma's army. Rimuru mentioned his improved relations with Inata and their information exchanges, highlighting Inata's skeptical nature. Knowing the sensitivity of discussing Inata with others, Yuki expressed his relief in confiding with Rimuru. Eventually, Rimuru invited Yuki to join the festival for a few days, to which Yuki eagerly agreed, having made arrangements for his responsibilities at the guild. After Yuuki left to fetch someone, Rimuru relaxed with his tea until Yuuki returned with a woman named Kagali, the vice master of the free guild. Kagali, with her elegant appearance and pointed ears, appeared to be an elf. She explained that she had recently returned from exploring ancient ruins at Soma, a notable achievement that earned a respect in the adventurer community. Despite not being widely known before, Kagali's talent was recognized by Yuuki, who valued exploration as much as combat in the guild. Her mapping of the ruins at Soma elevated her status within the guild and the world, highlighting her expertise and paving the way for further discoveries in the future. Yeah, that's the thing with ruins, Rimuru pondered. They're often in tricky spots, like the barren lands, where nobody really has jurisdiction. Kigali explained that the free guild manages the Soma complex, but other ruins and unclaimed lands don't have a clear owner. That could lead to complications when it comes to who owns the treasures found inside. Yuki understood Rimuru's concern, especially considering the unknown ruins near Clayman's castle, likely filled with valuable magic items. While exploring them could yield significant rewards, there was a risk of attracting opportunistic adventurers or even criminals. Rimuru recognized the importance of preserving the historical value of such treasures, as they offered insights into ancient civilizations and their practices. It's natural to romanticize about ancient times, Rimuru reflected. But if we let just anyone vandalize ruins, we risk losing irreplaceable artifacts. Concerned about preserving historical treasures, Rimuru brought up the topic with Yuki and Kigali. He mentioned another ruin in Clayman's old domain, where valuable treasures were likely stored. However, Rimuru emphasized that he wasn't interested in pondering for treasure alone. He wanted to understand the culture and history of ancient civilizations. Recognizing the importance of respecting the past, Rimu ordered the ruin close to outside visitors for the time being. Yuki and Kigali agreed, understanding the need for a careful and respectful approach to exploration. Rimu felt relieved that Kigali understood the need to protect the ruins, but he realized there was still one issue to address. 
He explained that as the caretaker of Clayman's territory, he needed to discuss the ruins with Milan, who would eventually annex the land. Rimuru expressed his reluctance to rule the territory himself, especially considering its strategic importance as a buffer zone with the Eastern Empire. The Valley of Death, a road through the mountains, posed additional challenges with its undead inhabitants and potential empire activity. Rimuru considered leaving the management to Milim and relying on her if the empire made any moves. Yuki and Kagari showed interest in exploring the ruins but Rimuru noted that obtaining Milim's permission might involve her joining the expedition, which could be intimidating. Despite this, Rimuru remained optimistic believing that his presence alongside Milim would mitigate any concerns. Rimuru proposed to Kigali that she join their expedition to explore the ruins, offering to cover her expenses through the free guild and negotiate with Milim on her behalf. Kigali accepted the offer, showing both an interest in exploration and an appreciation for intellectual pursuits. With Yuuki's approval they finalized the plan, with Kigali taking charge of organizing the team while Rimuru handled negotiations with Milim. After bidding farewell to Kigali, Rimuru and Yuuki left the guild headquarters, excited about the prospect of exploring the ruins once the Founders Festival was over. Rimuru looked forward to learning from the expedition and hoped it would provide insights for their own town's dungeon. After leaving the guild headquarters, Rimuru removed his mask since he no longer needed to conceal his aura. Yuuki, carrying a large bag, was excited to chat, indicating his readiness for the trip. Rimuru confirmed that he would bring the kids along, now that things were settled with Hinata. They walked together toward the Free Academy in Inglesia, where they were quickly welcomed inside due to Yuki's honorary chairman status. The vice principal greeted them and led them to a classroom. As Rimuru entered the classroom, the kids rushed to greet him with excitement and some gentle complaints about his absence. Alice even tackled him, expressing how long his absence felt to them. Rimuru realized that time might seem different for kids than adults. They all expressed their joy at his return, with Chloe joining in too. Seeing Yuki, they eagerly asked if there would be a fight as promised. Rimuru chuckled, explaining there wasn't time for that today. Instead, he invited them all to his homeland for a festival, which they enthusiastically accepted, immediately eager to get ready without waiting for further details. After Rimuru called out to the kids to bring only a change of clothes, they dashed off like a whirlwind, leaving the teacher of the class bewildered. Rimuru reassured the teacher, praising his efforts with the children, who had clearly grown fond of him. The teacher, named Klaus, revealed that he was Rimuru's replacement, hired by the academy. As they conversed, Klaus mentioned the possibility of cancelling class, having been informed by the vice principal. Yuki explained that Klaus was once an A-ranked adventurer, nearing retirement. Surprised by Klaus's remark about potentially losing to the kids, Rimuru and Yuki acknowledged the children's remarkable growth since their training under Rimuru's guidance. As Klaus turned to attend to other matters, Rimuru contemplated the progress of his former students. Klaus approached Yuki with a request, expressing concern that he might soon be unable to defeat the children in combat. He proposed the idea of providing the kids with a mentor who could serve as a formidable challenge and guide their growth without letting them become arrogant. Rimuru understood the importance of this, considering the children's potential as elementalists and even heroes. However, finding a suitable instructor ranked or higher posed a challenge, as such individuals were typically engaged in more lucrative endeavors than teaching. Despite Klaus's acknowledgement of the difficulty, Rimuru offered an alternative suggestion to address the issue. Rimuru proposed starting a school in their homeland, with Hakuro serving as an instructor for swordsmanship. However, they also acknowledged the importance of the children learning life skills for human society, which they couldn't fully grasp in a monster-dominated environment. Rimuru suggested the kids could travel to Tempest for battle instruction and receive guidance on elemental spirits. They considered asking Inada for help with spirit magic but hesitated due to her stern nature. With the children returning, Rimuru decided to address these concerns later and focus on enjoying the festival for now, trusting they'd find solutions in due time. Leaving Ningoja's main gate, Rimuru set up a transport gate in a hidden spot, impressing the kids with his skill. Kenya joked about Rimuru visiting more often, and Rimuru promised to try. Not wanting to worry the kids with the dangers he faced, taking them to their lodging, Rimuru apologized for having work to do, but cheered them up with a pendant that granted them access to the festival's attractions. He explained the rules. They could enjoy the festivities, but once they spent a hundred silver coins, it was time to rest. Rimuru knew he couldn't watch them all day, so he let them roam freely, confident so his agents would keep them safe. Rimuru felt relieved knowing the kids had a generous budget for the festival and let them go off with excitement. 
He decided not to tell them about Ramirez yet, preferring to introduce her later. Seeing their anticipation made Rimuru smile, and he left them to enjoy their time. However, his break was interrupted when Soe informed him about the arrival of Masayuki, a hero outside of town. Rimuru went to greet him, observing Masayuki's arrival with a group of elves, and noting his pop idol appearance. Despite Masayuki's intimidating aura, Rimuru remained composed as the party approached him, curious about the hero's true abilities. Rimu greeted Masaoki and his party at the town's entrance, but their sarcastic remarks didn't sit well with him. Despite his irritation, Rimu kept his cool, aiming to maintain a friendly demeanor and avoid conflict. However, Masayuki's companions continued to provoke him, questioning his intentions and spreading rumors about his past. Despite attempts to defuse the situation, they insisted on challenging Rimuru. Feeling pressured, Rimuru knew he had to act before things escalated. But just as he was contemplating his next move, someone intervened by throwing him a lifeline. Then someone coming towards them. What's going on here? Yuki arrived, noticing the tension. Masaki finally spoke up, seemingly hoping for a peaceful resolution, but his companions persisted in provoking Rimuru. Yuki tried to calm him down, explaining that Rimuru sought harmony and had even fought Inata without malice. However, Jinrai and the others remained skeptical, insisting that Masaoki, as a hero, should confront Rimuru. Despite Masaoki's silence, his supporters were eager for a showdown. Yuki attempted to mediate, emphasizing that Rimuru posed no threat, but Jinrai remained distrustful, viewing Rimuru's demon lord's status with suspicion. With tensions escalating, Rimuru worried that they would never reach a mutual understanding until they get into a battle. Rimuru then accepted the challenge, but suggested a tournament at the festival where Masayuki and his team could also participate. It would provide an opportunity to observe their fighting style and assess the necessity of confrontation. Rimuru intended to restrict the competition to fighters below a rank for safety reasons. While Masayuki's companions were eager, Masayuki himself appeared hesitant, looking for an escape. Despite his initial reluctance, he eventually agreed. Yuki expressed concern, but Masayuki remained confident, assuring everyone that things would work out fine. Masayuki and his team departed, exuding confidence for the upcoming tournament. Rimuru reminded them that killing wouldn't be allowed. Yuki expressed concern about Rimuru's intention to fight Masayuki, unsure of the outcome. Rimuru acknowledged the uncertainty but saw the presence of a hero in the tournament as prestigious. Despite the looming challenge, Rimuru remained optimistic, viewing it as a manageable hurdle compared to past encounters. They decided to focus on the positive aspects and address any concerns later on. As evening fell, an elegant reception hall filled with important people from all over. Nobles adorned in their finest attire mingled, with some accompanied by their families, including children. The buffet-style dinner offered a variety of food, and there was a unique Japanese-style section with tatami mats where guests could relax. Although unfamiliar to many, some guests, like King Gazel, embraced the tradition. Rimuru conversed with Gazel about town developments including sewage treatment facilities and railway construction, proposing the idea of trains. Gazel quickly agreed, showing his trust and support. Meanwhile, Yom joined a conversation, showcasing the unlikely camaraderie between leaders of different nations, likely changing perceptions of Yom in the process. The three of them chatted casually, with Gazel's presence helping boost their image among the attendees. Gazel's support was evident, providing leverage for future negotiations. Rimuru appreciated Gazel's friendship and strategic backing. Meanwhile, some guests had the opportunity to experience the public bathhouse, which received positive feedback. Although bathhouses were common, the unique hot spring water attracted attention. Rimuru noted interest from other nations but deferred responses for later. As guests relaxed in the tatami area, Rimuru greeted them before taking his seat of honor, feeling the weight of the curious gazes upon him as the party officially began. Rimuru expressed gratitude to the guests and kept his speech short, emphasizing the enjoyment of food and hospitality. With waiters trained by Vester attending each table, the focus was on providing a memorable experience. Rimuru's toast marked the beginning of the festivities, with cold beer receiving enthusiastic applause. The Japanese-style service, including chilled glasses and elven girls in yukata serving drinks, added a unique charm to the event. Despite the unconventional mix of Japanese and Western styles, Rimuru remained unfazed by any chaos, viewing the party as a normal affair while observing the reactions of the guests. The tables were filled with delicious dishes crafted by Shuna and Mr. Yoshida, featuring smoked chitakan, kadir steaks, carriage fried chicken, and more. Palate cleansers like assorted fruit sorbets were also available, alongside dishes from the Walpurgis Festival, such as black tiger stew and grilled sage rooster. 
despite the challenges of sourcing rare ingredients, the food delighted the noble guests, all known food enthusiasts. Additionally, a large spear tuna, known for its exquisite taste, was showcased at the party. Despite its intimidating appearance, the fish offered lean red meat similar to tuna, and when paired with soy sauce, it was a hit with the attendees. Rimuruai caught the spear tuna himself, showcasing his growing skills in water. Hakuro expertly prepared the fish, impressing everyone with his precise knife work. Although Shun wanted to help, Rimuru insisted she stick to her role as a secretary and bodyguard. And initially startled by the appearance of the sea creature, the crab became intrigued as Hakuro skillfully transformed it into sashimi and sushi. The sight of the delicacies made Rimuru's mouth water, and he empathized with Hakuro's longing for sushi from his previous life. Despite the challenges of adapting to this world, Hakura's culinary skills brought a taste of home to the festivities. Compared to Hakuro, Rimuru felt fortunate. Recreating Japanese cuisine in this world was tough, as Hinata had also mentioned. Rimuru wondered about Hakuro's grandfather, Bekuyaraki, possibly from the Edo era. However, dwelling on the past wasn't productive. Meanwhile, the guests enjoyed the buffet praising Shuna and Yoshida's efforts. However, the sashimi and sushi made by Hakuro were overlooked, perhaps due to the intimidating appearance of the spear tuna. Rimuru encouraged others to try it, leading by example and enjoying the exquisite taste himself. Despite the initial hesitation, Hakuro remained optimistic, looking forward to sharing the delicacies over drinks later. Hakuro and the staff planned to enjoy the spear tuna with sake after the guests departed. While Hakuro seemed unfazed by the guests' lack of interest, he appeared almost to desire their dislike of the dish. However, it was Inata who surprised everyone by requesting a piece of tuna without wasabi, followed by Uki joining in, opting for wasabi. Inata's enjoyment of the tuna impressed Rimuru, despite his initial skepticism, and Yuki's arrival indicated he had been observing the scene and eagerly awaited his turn to try the delicacy. Yuki praised the sushi, expressing his emotion at the exquisite taste, while Inata admitted her longing for seafood and the challenges in acquiring it. Yuki explained the logistical difficulties of transporting seafood to inland areas due to safety concerns and inefficient transportation methods, highlighting the limitations of the world's logistics. Rimuru understood this issue well, recognizing the need to establish a distribution network to make Tempest's delicacies more widely available. Despite initial reluctance from the guests to try the sushi and sashimi, Inada and Yuuki's endorsement began to sway opinions. As they praised the food, a man from King Gezel's vicinity approached, signaling a potential change in attitude towards the delicacies. Dolph, captain of the Pegasus Knights, approached Sir Rimuru requesting some sushi. Hakuro swiftly prepared plates of sushi, sashimi, and also a mono broth, which were promptly served to King Gezel Yom and their companions. Their reactions were overwhelmingly positive, with Gazel and Yom expressing delight at the flavors. Soon, others clamored for a taste, making Hakuro happy but regretful for his own sake. As the party continued, Hinata and Yugi engaged in lively banter, adding to the atmosphere. The event was a success, attracting many guests who enjoyed both Western and Eastern cuisine. Rimuru saw this as an opportunity to strengthen relations and promote Tempest's culinary offerings. However, the festivities were interrupted by urgent news from a soldier, signaling a problem. Guards surrounded the reception hall, ensuring security for the political figures inside. Suddenly, a soldier burst in, followed by bodyguards from various nations, reporting the arrival of the Emperor of the Sorceress Dynasty of Thalion, Elmija Elru Thalion. While initially alarmed, it turned out to be a relief as it was just the Emperor's belated arrival. Gezel explained to Rimuru the significance of Omija's presence, highlighting Thalion's power and its history dating back over two millennia. Despite not being as old as Dwargan, Thalion held considerable influence, especially under Omija's leadership. Rimuru realized the importance of Omija's arrival, acknowledging Gezel's caution towards her. Despite Gezel's reservations, Omija's presence commanded respect. As she entered the hall, the atmosphere became tense, with everyone captivated by her beauty and aura of power. Rimuru couldn't help but be awed by her appearance, noting her resemblance to a young girl with fair skin, silver hair, and pointed ears. Gezel's wariness hinted at the significance of Omija's heritage and her formidable reputation. Rimuru noticed the formidable presence of Omija's entourage, each guard radiating immense power. Their ceremonial attire seemed magically enhanced, indicating their strength, possibly on par with Hinata's moonlight sword or even surpassing it. As Omija approached, a captivating voice drew everyone's attention, a mere presence exuding authority. Rimu sensed her heroic aura, signaling her significant power, perhaps rivaling even Gaza. 
wanting to foster a positive relationship, Weimu extended a warm welcome, while Amisha hinted at a private discussion in the future. Her casual demeanor revealed her true nature, resonating with Weimu's own journey as a demon lord. As Amisha mingled with the guests, Weimu noticed the absence of Artful Karal, but recognized one of Amisha's bards, acknowledging him with a note, intending to greet him formally later. After the intense interaction with Almija, Rimuru sought solace in the Tatominat area, relieved that her presence diverted attention. Gazel's almost spoken words hinted at potential trouble, averted by Almija's stern gaze. Rimuru acknowledged the need for caution, mindful of the elves' acute hearing. Despite wanting to unwind the arrival of another guest disrupted the tranquility. Rimuru exchanged nods with Xion, acknowledging Milim's arrival, prompting Yon's less than flattering comment about her appearance. Yun's lingering animosity towards Milim stemmed from their past conflict, showcasing his subdued dislike. Rimuru admired Yun's restraint, recognizing his ability to maintain composure in challenging situations. Gazel seemed intrigued by Milim's arrival, needing Yun to identify her. However, other familiar faces accompanying her, like Benimaru, Diablo, Gald, and Gobil, were recognized by Gazel. The Dwarf King appeared nervous, understandable given the company. Milim led the group with confidence, flanked by Midre, a bald man, and Hermes, a robed attendant. Behind them trailed Carolyn and Frey, former demon lords exuding authority and presence. Carolyn was followed by the three lichen for peers, including Phobio, while Frey was attended by the Twin Wings, a pair of beautiful twins known for their prowess. As Rimuru rose to greet them, Milim's joyous demeanor was evident, expressing excitement about the feast. Rimuru asked Milim if there were any issues between her and Frey, given their recent interactions, but she assured him everything was fine. Milim seemed nervous, suggesting she might not be telling the whole truth. Frey apologized for the tardiness, explaining that it took time to prepare Milim's ceremonial attire. Rimuru tried to reassure Frey, avoiding direct eye contact to hide any nervousness. Despite feeling uneasy, Rimuru remained composed externally aware of Frey's intuitive nature. Frey expressed gratitude for Rimuru's invitations and assistance in building a new city, emphasizing how much she had to thank him for. Rimuru then asked if there were any ingredients she couldn't eat, mentioning chicken. That was only then that Rimuru realized his mistake, causing tension in the air. Frey questioned if Rimuru was comparing her to Lysta, but he quickly apologized, feeling embarrassed. Carolyn and Milim found the situation amusing, while Frey became annoyed. Rimuru apologized again, admitting his mistake and trying to defuse the situation. Frey, however, was surprisingly understanding, seeing Rimuru's reaction as a test of his character. She appreciated his humility and considered him a positive influence on Milim's growth and maturity. This encounter helped bridge the gap between Milim and Frey, as Frey recognized Rimuru's positive impact. Bowing to Frey was the right thing to do, as she was testing Rimuru's character. If he set a bad example, it might have prevented Milim from visiting. Her phrase actions showed that she cared for Milim's well-being, despite appearing intimidating. Rimuru then questioned Carolyn about the situation, prompting Frey to swiftly reprimand him with a powerful grip. Despite Carolyn's protests, Frey's hold remained firm, showing her strength. Milim understood the lesson, pledging to avoid angering Frey in the future. Rimuru used the moment to teach Milim about taking responsibility for one's actions using Carolyn's plight as an example. As Carolyn struggled, Rimuru and Milim observed learning from his mistake. While the commotion with Carolyn was unfolding, Shuna continued her duties cheerfully, bringing up more food to the delight of the crowd. As Carolyn complained about being ignored, Rimuru and Milim reassured him that Frey's actions weren't serious. Carolyn, however, insisted that Frey's grip had nullified his skills, suggesting it might be a unique ability of hers. Meanwhile, Shuna served a special meal to Milim's party, aiming to impress Midre. Milim expressed her gratitude, sharing a friendly exchange with Shuna. However, Midre expressed disapproval of Milim's behavior, hinting at concerns about her influence. As dinner was served to Milim's servant, Midre he immediately began scolding Rimuru, just as Milim had warned in her letter. Meanwhile, Hermes looked apologetic, fearing Midre's words might cause trouble. Observing from a distance the nobility were keenly interested in how Milim and her group would react to the food, especially after Midre's criticism. Some wondered if humans and magic born like Milim could ever see eye to eye on culinary matters. Despite this, Hermes seemed interested in introducing the concept of cuisine to the dragon faithful. 
Wimuru decided to confront Midre, who deemed the food offerings blasphemous, criticizing the alterations made to natural ingredients. This angered Shuna, who retaliated with a glare, while Hermes nervously bowed to Wimuru and Shuna. However, Midre continued his tirade, expressing outrage at involving Milim in what he saw as disrespectful behavior. As Midre continued to lecture Wimuru about his food theories, it became clear why Milim sought help. Trying to reason with him was exhausting. As he refused to listen to anyone else's perspective, Rimuru realized that the issue wasn't different tastes but Midre's closed-mindedness. Despite Milim eagerly awaiting the food, Midre adamantly refused to even try it. With a growing audience, including lower-ranked guests drawn by the commotion, Rimuru faced the risk of losing credibility if he failed to persuade Midre. Milim and Hermes suggested asking Midre to leave temporarily, acknowledging his stubbornness. Rimuru considered postponing the discussion, recognizing that rushing it wasn't necessary since the festival hadn't officially started yet. However, Shuna intervened by slamming her hands on the table, surprising everyone with her swift reaction. Shuna, with a determined expression, forcefully presented a bowl of stew to Midre, explaining that Rimuru envisioned each ingredient in its ideal state. She emphasized the unity of various races under Rimuru's leadership, highlighting the collective strength they possessed. Despite Rimuru's initial disbelief, Shuna's persuasion led Midre to reluctantly try the stew, which pleasantly surprised him. Recognizing the harmony of flavors, Midre acknowledged its depth and quality. Meanwhile, Hermes, embarrassed by Midre's previous behavior, expressed his discomfort at being associated with his boss's actions. Rimuru empathized with Hermes's predicament and offered him a supportive nod. As Midre finished the stew, Shuna explained the broader significance of cuisine, lightening different dishes to various territories and kingdoms. She emphasized the importance of diverse connections, drawing parallels between culinary diversity and diplomatic relations. Midre, along with the onlookers, began to understand the depth of Rimuru's vision for unity and cooperation. The crowd enthusiastically discussed Shuna's ideas, impressed by her persuasive speech and the delectable food before them. Despite the lack of thematic coherence in the buffet, Shuna's message resonated deeply. Rimuru, observing Shuna's success, admired her ability to inspire others with her words and culinary creations. As Shuna urged everyone to enjoy the warm food, Rimuru pretended not to notice her subtle glance at Xion, focusing instead on the positive impact of her message of harmony. Milim eagerly dug into the food, her joyful expression speaking volumes without needing fancy words. Midre, too, realized his mistake and joined in. Despite Hermes's attempt to lighten the mood, Midre's frustration was evident, though eventually overshadowed by laughter and camaraderie. Even Binimaru couldn't help but admire Shuna's role in the evening's success. As the feast extended into the night, fueled by late arrivals and hearty appetites, it became clear that despite some hiccups, it was a resounding triumph. And so, with full bellies and smiles all around, the pre-opening feast concluded, exceeding everyone's expectations. After the midnight banquet, a sudden emergency meeting was called, and despite exhaustion, everyone gathered. Expressing gratitude, Rimuru thanked Shuna for her culinary skills, acknowledging her success in convincing Midre. Shuna modestly redirected praise to Yoshida, who supported her efforts. Rimuru also commended Hakuro for his exceptional seafood preparations, recognizing his expertise in handling fish. Turning to Miramayo, Rimuru inquired about merchant activities, pleased to hear positive feedback about the town's allure and the quality of goods arriving, fostering potential alliances with neighboring farmers. Miramayo, with a glance at rigor for confirmation, reassured Rimuru about the abundance of fresh produce, meat, and craft brought by merchants for the festival. Lelina chimed in, mentioning plans to incorporate these goods into the evening banquets. However, Miramayo hesitated, hinting at unrecognized faces among the tradespeople, which intrigued him. After investigating, he found no issues, but his curiosity lingered. Despite his concerns, interactions with the new arrivals were positive. Rimuru, noticing Miramal's unease, urged him to share his thoughts openly, prompting Miramal to admit feeling a bit tense due to his expanded responsibilities. Rimuru, concerned for his well-being, encouraged him to prioritize his health. Miramal laughed off Rimuru's concerns about his workload, revealing that Hiro Masaki would participate in the upcoming battle tournament, causing a buzz in town. So he then steered the conversation towards discussing Masayuki's involvement. Shion, frustrated by Masayuki's boasting, admitted her urge to confront him, but so he intervened to prevent any trouble, reminding her of the festival stakes. Binimaru acknowledged Shion's restraint and urged her to stay calm, 
while Diablo praised her protective instincts and he questioned Binimaru's hypothetical reaction to the situation. Binimaru assured he would remain composed, though his hesitation hinted at makes leaving Rimuru raising doubt about his composure in similar situations. Diablo suggested dealing with the hero in a drastic manner, but Rimuru quickly dismissed the idea, emphasizing the importance of caution. He then shifted the discussion to allowing his staff to participate in the upcoming battle tournament. Binimaru, Shion, and Diablo showed keen interest, with Geld and Zoe also expressing their willingness to join. However, Rimu reminded them of their duties in town and urged them to reconsider. Despite their enthusiasm, Rimu decided to exclude Benimaru, Xian, Diablo and Zoe from participating. Randa remained indifferent, still asleep by Rimuru's side. Rimu quashed any potential arguments about joining the tournament, asserting that they had other tasks to focus on. Amid protests from Zoe, Rimu intervened, reminding Zoe of his covert duties and appointing him as the head of intelligence operations dubbed the Oniwaban with a personal team named Kureyami. Zoe enthusiastically accepted the role. Rimuru then devised a plan to keep the three strongest members of his staff, Binimaru, Xiong, and Diablo, occupied by establishing the Big Four Committee to handle dignitaries from the Western nations. Binimaru was named as the head, with Xiong and Diablo appointed to other key positions, effectively diverting their attention from the tournament. This strategy intrigued and engaged them, ensuring they remain focused on their new responsibilities. Binimaru gladly accepted the leadership role within the Big Four, while Xion and Diablo also agreed to their appointments, albeit with varying levels of enthusiasm. Rimuru then explained that the Big Four positions were created as a way to divert their attention from the tournament, offering it as a ceremonial role. However, he revealed that the fourth spot was still open and proposed a friendly competition among them to fill it, with the winner earning the title and responsibilities of the Big Four. As Rimuru awaited their response, unexpected hesitancy arose from the attendees, with one individual expressing prior commitments but willing to participate if Rimuru insisted. Akiro, the person Rimuru was relying on the most, backed out unexpectedly due to a prior commitment with his daughter. Rimuru understood the importance of family promises and didn't want to strain Akiro's relationship with his daughter. As for Gobil, he declined joining the tournament due to his responsibilities in running the science presentation, leaving Geld as Rimuru's final choice. Geld accepted the challenge with determination to thwart Masayuki's victory. While Rimuru acknowledged Geld's strength, he hesitated about including him in the Big Four, but decided to address the concern later. For now, he hoped Geld could spar with Masayuki to assess his abilities. As Rimuru contemplated his options, Raider suggested another candidate for the Big Four, Gopta, due to his strength and potential. Although Rimuru had reservations about Gopta's abilities, he agreed based on Raider's endorsement and Akuro's support. Despite Gopta's casual demeanor, he was chosen to represent them in the tournament. Just as Rimuru was about to conclude the meeting, Rangu expressed his desire to join the competition, but Rimuru and Miyuramail pointed out the practical challenges of having a summoned creature participate, ultimately deciding against Ranga's involvement to maintain the integrity of the tournament. Ranga seemed disappointed, but Rimuru had to make a firm decision against his participation in the tournament. Instead, he granted Gelden Gupta a bye for the first round, ensuring their placement in the quarterfinals. With over 200 participants they planned to divide them into six groups for a battle royale in the qualifiers. Rimuru delegated the management of the tournament to Miramile, expressing confidence in his abilities. He also assigned Diablo, known internationally, as the referee for the matches, trusting his capability to handle any issues that might arise. After wrapping up the meeting, Rimuru advised everyone to get some rest before the tournament began the next day. After meeting with the monster leaders in the forest of Jora, Rimuru's discussions with representatives from the Western nations went smoothly. Rigard and Mirama handled the practical aspects, ensuring that people didn't approach Rimuru with offers directly. This precaution prevented Rimuru from committing to anything hastily. While Rimuru was willing to offer support to build relationships, it was important to be cautious until they knew more about the other parties. With the shortage of personnel and numerous pending projects after the festival, adding more work would only overwhelm them further. Rimuru needed to avoid overcommitting and focus on managing the existing workload effectively. Rigid and Miyurama's efficiency sometimes made Rimuru rely on them too much, but after a late night meeting, Rimuru resolved to not let them spoil him. Today, as the Tempest Founders Festival began on a sunny day, Rimuru, the leader of Tempest, addressed the diverse crowd gathered in the capital, 
Looking out from the balcony of the main assembly hall, Rimuru saw former monsters, now known as demi-humans, magic-born beings from the forest of Jora, merchants, adventurers and farmers, all numbering over a hundred thousand. Seeing them together peacefully filled Rimuru's heart with a sense of accomplishment. Rather than delivering a formal speech, Rimuru spoke from the heart, expressing the desire to create a nation where everyone, regardless of their background, could coexist and thrive by working together for a better future. As Rimuru spoke, he noticed the attentive ears of both his subjects and the casual attendees, sensing a momentum in his words. He expressed understanding for any wariness towards him as a demon lord but emphasized his genuine desire for trust to develop naturally over time. He urged the nobles present to honestly convey their experiences back to their countries, highlighting the friendly relations already established with several nations. Rimuru also issued a warning against unequal treatment or attempts to eradicate his nation, citing the recent destruction of the Kingdom of Farmers as a stark example. While he disliked war, he made it clear that he would defend his people without hesitation if necessary, emphasizing the paramount importance of protecting lives and ensuring the safety of all within his nation. Rimuru acknowledged that a world without military power was just a dream, especially for rulers who had to be prepared for any situation. He addressed the ruling class, emphasizing the need for readiness. He then assured merchants, adventurers, and common folk that his nation welcomed them and guaranteed their rights, encouraging them to consider moving there for work. Ending his speech, he admitted to feeling unsure but was met with applause from the crowd, indicating their belief in him and his country. Rimuru was content with this, knowing that not everyone would be immediately convinced. With his honest speech, the Tempest Founders Festival officially began, awaiting people's reactions. After the speech concluded, Rimuru descended to the first floor hall, where he was met by his children, who seemed surprised to learn of his royal status. Kenya expressed skepticism, prompting Rimuru to playfully ask for more respect. Alice and Chloe hugged him tightly, while Gail and Ryota expressed their surprise. Rimuru assured them he would still make time for them despite his new responsibilities. He reminded them of the festival rules and ensured they had their essentials before sending them off with a smile. Rimuru contemplated assigning a chaperone for his children at the festival but realized his staff was already occupied. Diabo was officiating at the Colosseum, Hakura was spending time with Mamaji, and Binimaru was on guard duty. Shuna was busy running a cafe, and Shion seemed occupied with her own affairs, so he was overseeing town security, reassuring Rimuru about any potential trouble. However, his thoughts were interrupted by the sudden appearance of Inada, who approached him. As Rimuru introduced her to his children, they were taken aback by her presence and her formidable aura. When Kenya made a questionable remark, Inada swiftly reacted, causing him to retract his statement in fear. Rimuru could only sigh at the situation. Ryota wanted to help but felt stuck. Hinata's gaze froze him in place, and Gail was also fascinated and unable to move. Kenya looked regretful, realizing Hinata was more experienced than he thought. The kids were surprised to learn Hinata's identity and were impressed by her strength. Kenya was so scared he fell to the ground, making Alice tease him. Chloe pointed out it was Kenya's fault for provoking Hinata. Hinata put her sword away, calming everyone down. They asked Rimuru about his fight with Hinata, and he admitted it ended in a draw. Hinata offered to babysit the children, surprising Rimuru, who was relieved. Kenya and Gil quickly agreed, impressed by her. Ryota followed suit, expressing his admiration for Hinata. Alice was excited too, seeing Hinata as a role model like Masayuki. Koei hugged Hinata, seeing her as a kind person like Shizu. Hinata suggested they visit the food stalls first, showing her leadership. Rimuru felt relieved leaving the children with her. Hinata then whispered to him about Lady Luminous's presence, who had disguised herself as a paladin for the event. She had stayed in a church built by Rimuru without his knowledge, impressing him with her cunning. As Inata left with the children, Rimuru felt a sudden surge of worry. Inata seemed carefree while he felt burdened by her offer. Once Inata was gone, Yuki appeared, wearing a modified school uniform, and commented on her rare smile. Rimuru expressed surprise at Inata's willingness to watch the kids, but Yuki mentioned her caring nature and praised her fashion sense, noting her expensive dress made from special silk. Rimuru speculated on Hinata's wealth and Yuuki suggested she might be spurging for the festival. Rimuru realized Hinata's excitement for the festival might explain why she entrusted him with Lady Luminous. Yuuki mentioned Hinata had been excitedly scouting the festival stalls for food like yakisoba and roasted corn. So, Hinata had scoped out the festival grounds yesterday, showing her serious dedication to the event. The stalls were all set up, offering various foods like burgers, hot dogs, fries, and juices. 
along with local favorites like yakisoba and kadir kebabs. There was even shaved ice, although it was a bit early for the season. Rimuru made sure the food was top-notch, with Shuna and her staff bringing his ideas to life. Velder even had his own grilled food joint. Uki speculated that Inata might be a bigger fan of junk food than expected, which surprised Rimuru. Knowing this about Inata was interesting, but Rimuru hoped she wouldn't set a bad example for the kids by spending too much money. So, Rimuru headed to the reception hall with Benimaru and Yuuki. Rigard praised Rimuru's earlier speech, which made Rimuru feel good. Rigor then led the noble group to the concert hall, which had been quickly remodeled and looked impressive. The visitors sat in their assigned seats without any problems. Rimuru couldn't help but compare the cultural level of this world to Japan, feeling a bit biased. He believed that culture should be nurtured by society as a whole, not just the nobility. Rimuru wanted to spread culture from his nation and find hidden genius within it. The concert event was their first step in achieving this goal. They even found familiar musical instruments, including a piano in Clayman's mansion, revealing his luxurious lifestyle. Among the monster races, many had a knack for music, with yearly festivals featuring flute and drum rhythms. Rimuru provided practice instruments and basic music lessons, thanks to his friend Raphael compiling knowledge from both worlds into a single book. Monsters improved rapidly through their own efforts and some recreated sheet music. Copyright concerns weren't an issue in this world, allowing cultural expansion freely. The orchestra consisted of violins, trumpets, kettle drums, and even a piano, with monsters playing effortlessly. Despite Rimuru's lack of musical talent, he eagerly awaited the performance, which began with a diverse group of confident performers led by a halfling conductor. That boy who once felt useless had found his calling. Known as Baton, he was too weak for construction, not good at math or farming, and struggled in the armed forces, but he excelled at motivating others through song. Rimuru recommended him to the military band, where his passion shone. As Baton led the orchestra, the music captivated the audience, spanning generations with its beauty and emotion. Each musician found pride in this skill, proving their worth through their hard work and talent. Their performance was so moving that anyone who doubted them before would surely be impressed now. Rimuru was amazed by the orchestra's performance, even comparing it favorably to classical concerts in Japan. The transition from classical to anime and pop tunes surprised him, but Raphael explained that it was based on Rimuru's memories for maximum enjoyment. While Rimuru and Yuki found it unexpected, the audience, unfamiliar with the music, was captivated. The orchestra's renditions of famous classical and modern pieces enchanted the crowd, proving the concert a great success. The concert ended after 60 minutes, planned with shorter sets to keep the audience engaged. Rimuru, proud of the team's success, prepared to applaud when Baton signaled the end. Suddenly, the lights went out, and the crowd murmured nervously until spotlights revealed Shuna and Shun on stage. Shuna wore a party dress while Shun appeared in a captivating slip dress. They bowed deeply, capturing everyone's attention, but Rimuru wondered what they were about to do. As Shuna approached the piano and Shun picked up a violin, it became clear they were going to perform a duet. Rimuru worried, remembering Shion's past mishaps with food, wondering if her musical skills were any better. But Shuna wouldn't let Shion mess things up, and Miramel seemed confident too, risking everything for the event. I decided to trust them and waited anxiously for the performance to begin. The piano and violin started slowly, building into an intense yet harmonious melody, reflecting Shion's intensity and Shuna's gentleness. It was captivating, touching me deeply with its expressive sound, perhaps influenced by Shuna's background as an oracle and Shion's protective role. As the performance ended, I tried to applaud loudly, but Luminous, disguised as a maid, beat me to it, followed by others including nobility and even unexpected individuals like Midrain. Despite the lack of a custom for encores, the stage was lit again for one final song, showing how art can unite people and inspire wonder in everyone. The concert was a big hit with everyone talking about it as we headed to lunch. People praised the performance, not caring if the musicians were humans or monsters as long as the music was good. Someone even approached Rimuru, asking how they could hear it again. Rimuru mentioned they'd have more concerts over the next few days and thought about having them regularly. Luminous complimented Rimuru on the performance, surprising him, and Benimaru explained that Shion and Shuna's musical talents weren't unexpected to him, as they often sang while working. This made Rimuru realize he still had a lot to learn about everyone. After lunch, the group moved to the museum for a science presentation, but Rimuru realized it might have been better earlier in the day. Lester, a former minister, led the tour, showing off healing potions and explaining their effectiveness. However, Rimuru noticed many were bored and disengaged. Lester then proposed a scientific experiment to demonstrate the potion's strength using a broken sword. When someone objected, saying potions only work on living things, Garbil, another presenter, 
agreed and questioned how far the rule applied. This caused confusion and protests among the audience, who felt underestimated. How far could healing potions work? They usually worked on living beings like people, animals, plants, and monsters. But what about non-living things like swords? It seemed obvious that they wouldn't work on them. But then Kaijin mentioned that swords might have their own wills. Vesta, despite initially doubting the idea, decided to try an experiment. He sprinkled some healing potion on a broken sword, and to everyone's surprise it showed signs of repair. This revelation shocked the tour group including Rimuru, who hadn't anticipated such results. Vesta explained that only certain weapons, like those made of magisteel and regularly used by their owners would react to the potion, suggesting a level of maturity in a weapon. So, why did they want to know if healing potions worked on swords? Gobel explained that they were curious about the effects of healing potions on different things. They found that healing potions worked on plants, even restoring damaged tree bark and helping broken branches grow new buds. Gobel speculated that plants might evolve into powerful monsters over time under certain conditions. He also noted that only things with magic cures, the magical particles in this world, showed a reaction to healing potions, suggesting a connection between magic cures and consciousness. This led them to question what magic cures actually were. Magic cures were unique substances in their world, similar to oxygen, and they powered various mysterious forces that people could control to some extent. So here's a planned sample, and I'll show you a big picture of it in the other room, Vester said as he led us to a spacious chamber set up like a college lecture hall. There was a projector in the room, still in testing, with a white sheet serving as a screen on the wall. Gizzle checked out the projector quietly, showing his mature manners. Once seated, Gobel turned on the projector, displaying color images of the plant, sample structure and some grass. As the images were compared, most of the audience couldn't see a difference. Then, Vester and Gobel revealed that one was Hippocute Herb, used in healing potions, while the other was just regular grass. Some people caught on, but others felt tricked. Hippocute was rare, and seeing it look similar to everyday grass was unsettling for Gazel and others, including me. Who knew its importance? Gazel's expression showed his concern. We were showing that Hippocute and regular grass had the same structure, suggesting they were essentially the same. Vester quieted the room and explained the process of making healing potion from Hippocute extract, emphasizing its high purity. Then he moved on to Hippocute leaves, which could be ground to make a weak healing ointment. As images of the leaf and the extraction process were displayed, Vester revealed a surprising discovery. He noticed changes in the strained leaves from the extraction process, leading him to investigate further. Despite initially dismissing the ointment, he realized its potential significance and began studying the strained leaves more closely. And then Gobel discovered that the shape of the leaves after extraction was different from the hippocute plants growing in the cave. Excitedly, Vesta proclaimed that hippocute was actually a mutation caused by high magicule concentrations, not a distinct plant species. The revelation caused a stir among the audience, with some urging caution in announcing such a significant discovery. The room descended into chaos as everyone discussed the implications including Gazel and other prominent figures. It suddenly made sense to me, just like hippocute was a mutation of grass, metal might mutate into magisteel, explaining why healing potions could potentially work on swords. It all tied back to the surprising experiment we witnessed earlier. The attendees initially showed signs of boredom during the scientific presentation, but as Vesta delved into thought-provoking questions about the nature of magic cures and their effects, the atmosphere shifted. Gobel and Vesta's synchronized conclusion left a lasting impression, showcasing a balance of innovation and secrecy that maintained their technological advantage. The event successfully engaged the audience's intellectual curiosity following the morning's musical entertainment, suggesting the organizers had chosen the right sequence of events. As the session ended, there was a sense of anticipation for future breakthroughs, with attendees buzzing about the stimulating content presented. After the presentation, everyone scattered to enjoy the festival's activities, including the VIPs. Some relaxed at the salon, others explored food stalls in disguise, while some opted for the hot springs or amusement facilities. Arnold and Bacchus approached with concern, leading Rimuru to a room where Luminous awaited, dressed provocatively in a maid outfit. Despite the treaty of non-aggression, Luminous emphasized the need for more interaction between their groups. Rimuru tried to understand her urgency, puzzled by her insistence on increased contact. In simple terms, there was an agreement between Tempest and the Holy Empire of Rubelius, but they lacked meaningful interaction. Rimuru appreciated the non-aggression pact but acknowledged the need for cultural exchange. Luminous proposed sending her musicians for training in Tempest, while Rimuru would learn the secret skills of faith and favor in return. 
These skills would allow Rimuru's followers to use holy magic. Despite some hesitation, Rimuru accepted the offer, realizing its value. After resolving negotiations, they discussed upcoming exchanges, and Lumina subtly warned Rimuru about certain dignitaries, signaling the end of their conversation. After finishing their conversation with Luminous, it was time for dinner, and Rimuru found themselves seated with Yuuki and Hinata. While Hinata opted for Japanese cuisine, Rimuru and Yuuki chose Western dishes. Yuuki praised the orchestra's performance, successfully diverting Hinata's attention from a sensitive topic. Hinata, having enjoyed the festival, shared her interest in Magic Cule's research due to her unique physiology. Rimuru acknowledged being affected by Magic Cule's too leading to a discussion about their growth and experiences in their respective worlds. Overall, they enjoyed their meal and lively conversation as the evening progressed. As the dinner conversation continued, Yuki and Hinata teased Rimuru about his oversight regarding research. Despite Rimuru's attempt to downplay the situation, he couldn't escape the scrutiny of his friends. Reflecting on his actions, Rimuru acknowledged his mistake and vowed to be more careful in the future. Despite the lighthearted banter, Rimuru felt a tinge of regret for not being more involved in the research process. However, the evening concluded on a positive note, with Rimuru enjoying the meal and feeling optimistic about the festival's successful start. Little did Rimuru know, challenges awaited him in the days to come, revealing the naivety of his optimism. Everyone gathered in the meeting hall for an update, waiting for Miramile, who was running late. It was around 9 in the evening, just after dinner. Outside. The festival was still lively, with music and laughter filling the air. Since the festival's closing time was at 10, noise wasn't a concern for those staying in the nobles' accommodations. Despite wanting to explore the evening market, Rimuru aimed to finish the meeting earlier than the previous night's late hour. Offering praise to Shuna and Xian for their outstanding performance earlier in the day, he commended their talent and dedication to practice, noting Shuna's proficiency in singing and playing the piano and Xian's graceful mastery of the violin. Their efforts to surprise him were successful, earning them well-deserved praise. Yeah, you did really well. Are you gonna keep it up? Asked Rimuru. Yes, I want to play all the songs you remembered, replied Sean. I look forward to that, said Rimuru. Then Rimuru praised Gobel for his presentation, saying it was interesting and successful. Gobel thanked him and mentioned Vester's help. Diablo updated Rimuru about the arena, but Rimuru told him not to interfere with the hero. With the tournament competitor settled, Rimuru decided to wait for tomorrow's fun battles based on Diablo's advice. Next, Soi shared that the kids had fun at the festival, watching Masaoki in the tournament and buying lots of food and souvenirs, which made Rimuru worry about their stomachs. While waiting for Miramai, they chatted, expecting a quick meeting, but Miramai arrived looking panicked, explaining they were out of money because they couldn't convert Clayman's assets into usable currency. Rimuru thought they had plenty from Diablo's stash and restitution from Farmers, but Miramai clarified that the assets weren't in the right currency for tradesmen who wanted standard gold coins from the Dwarven Kingdom. Miramai paid the tradesmen with regular gold coins at first, but later found out they only accepted a specific currency. When they ran out of coins, he used his own money, but it wasn't enough. He learned that the new tradesmen insisted on the common currency, unlike the older ones who were okay with ISR ancient gold pieces. Diablo and Miramal suspected someone was behind this scheme, making it hard for them to pay. Even Rigger felt bad for not realizing the extent of the problem, understanding it wasn't just Miramal's fault. So someone's trying to ruin our reputation? Rimu asked. Yes, according to the international rules, payments must be made with specific gold coins, replied Miramal. They considered involving the free guild. But these merchants followed rules set by the Council of the West. Changing rules could upset the Council and harm future alliances. Miramal suspected someone high up was orchestrating this, aiming beyond just tarnishing their reputation. Rimuru agreed they couldn't enforce their own rules without risking alliances with humans. They needed to handle the situation carefully to avoid causing further problems. In the midst of their discussion, Sean raised a pertinent question about the economic alliance that Rimuru had envisioned with Thalion, Bumund, Dwarkon, Farminus, and Milim's domain. She pointed out that ignoring Tempest could result in significant losses for these nations. Rimuru was taken aback by Shion's insightful analysis, acknowledging her astuteness. Diablo concurred with Shion's assessment, delving into the complexities of human behavior and societal hierarchies. Binimaru probed further, questioning whether the Council feared the potential threat posed by their economic alliance. Diablo confirmed Binimaru's suspicion, explaining the Council's concerns. While Rimuru appreciated the cooperation among his team, he dismissed Diablo's extreme sentiments, so he proposed investigating the tradesmen's backgrounds to uncover any connections that might shed light on the situation. However, Rimuru decided to postpone the investigation until after the festival, prioritizing the 
So he proposed investigating the tradesmen's backgrounds to uncover any connections that might shed light on the situation. However, Rinmuru decided to postpone the investigation until after the festival, prioritizing the immediate issue of addressing the payment predicament. Rimuru decided they would follow council rules for now and deal with any rule breaking later, as it wasn't urgent enough to escalate into conflict. Miramal explained that the tradesmen were willing to wait until after the festival to be paid. Rimuru considered using gold bars from the Beast Kingdom to make fake coins, but Raphael pointed out that dwarven coins had magical serial numbers, making counterfeits easily detectable. Rimuru realized the severity of counterfeiting in this world, understanding why magic and technology were used to regulate currency. Wimuru suggested paying the tradesmen with pure gold bars they had, but Mirama rejected the idea, explaining that it would show weakness and set a bad precedent for future negotiations. Despite the challenge, Mirama promised to do his best to gather the needed coins in the remaining two days. Rimuru thanked him and acknowledged that they might have to be firm and force their rules on the tradesmen if necessary. However, Wimuru remained confident that they would find a fair solution and emphasized that they wouldn't let the tradesmen leave empty-handed. He reassured his team not to worry too much and to focus on doing their best, reminding them that Tempest had its own way of doing things and they would handle the situation accordingly. You got it, Mirama responded with a brightened demeanor. Rimuru felt optimistic about facing the council, and hoped they'd have identified their adversary by then, though he hesitated to label them as an enemy just yet. With the meeting adjourned, Rimuru wrapped up the progress report for the evening, acknowledging the challenges procrastination brought but not dwelling on them too much. Sensing Miramile's stress, Rimuru suggested taking a break at the festival, and Miramile agreed. They headed out together, joined by others like Benimaru, ready to unwind. Despite Miramile's initial concern about raising money, Rimuru reassured him to relax for the time being. As they set off, Shuna cautioned them not to party too hard. Later, Rimuru witnessed a disagreement between a silver-haired girl and a takoyaki stall owner but decided to let it go, adhering to the wisdom of avoiding unnecessary trouble. And so, he enjoyed the rest of the night at the festival. Next morning, Rimuru had too much to drink at the festival and found himself unexpectedly experiencing a headache. He usually used his council poison ability to avoid feeling the effects of alcohol, but he had toned it down for the occasion. When he tried to use his council pain ability to alleviate the headache, he found it wasn't working properly. Despite complaining to Raphael, his assistant, about the situation, Rimuru was left to deal with the pain on his own. He regretted overindulging and promised himself to be more careful in the future although he admitted he often made the same mistake again. Eventually, he apologized to Raphael and asked for relief from the pain. Raphael's frustration was evident, but eventually, Rimuru's headache subsided. Rimuru resolved to be more cautious about drinking in the future, lightening it to the balance of eating food. Later, he visited the exclusive Elfran Club on the 95th floor of the dungeon with Miramile and friends. Despite it being a gathering for foreign dignitaries, Rimuru ended up drinking heavily with Gazel and Vester, spurred on by praise for his friends. This led to Gazel offering help with their missing gold coins, and Archduke Geralt promising assistance. Rimuru attributed their success to the power of alcohol. The next day they prepared for day two of the Founders' Festival with tired faces. They were at the newly built Colosseum, a massive arena that could hold 50,000 people comfortably. The stands were shaded from direct sunlight by a roof shaped like dragon wings, designed to look ominous. While it was mainly for sun protection, the attendees found it eerie and exciting. Thanks to Miramel's efforts, the stands were packed, showing his capabilities despite feeling down the night before. The arena floor was made of giant stones infused with magic cules, making it incredibly sturdy and resistant to both magic and physical attacks. Surrounding the arena were two defensive barriers, a magic circle covering the floor for battle training and a circular zone for spectators to watch the fights. This was where the tournament battles would take place. The dual barriers were set up to protect the arena and prevent any stray damage from reaching the stands. The first barrier blocked magic from entering or leaving but didn't stop abilities used inside. To ensure safety, I had Uriel, my ultimate skill, ready to trigger absolute defense if things got too intense. Despite my reluctance to reveal it publicly, it was better than risking injuries to spectators. With these precautions, I felt confident about the tournament. The tiered seating in the Colosseum accommodated everyone, and giant screens provided close-up views of the action thanks to optical magic. These details were crucial for our presentation, a lesson I learned from my corporate experience. The arena had screens everywhere, ensuring everyone had a good view of the action. As the competitors lined up, the announcer, Soka introduced them, one by one with dramatic flair. Masaoki, known as the hero, was the first to be introduced, with exaggerated praise for his fighting prowess. 
However, there was skepticism about his actual skills since he hadn't even drawn his sword in previous matches, relying instead on his friends to secure victories. Despite his large fan base, there was doubt about whether his reputation matched his abilities. The announcer hyped up Masayuki's entrance, but Rimuru found it exaggerated and wondered if it was meant to mock him. The next contestant, Jinrai, had a rugged appearance that gave off a tough vibe, despite his worn-out gear. Rimuru suspected there was more to him than met the eye. Gei, the third contestant, was praised for his sword skills, but Rimuru found the announcer's description of him dancing amidst blood unsettling. Despite not looking physically imposing, Gei seemed skilled and capable as an adventurer. The chiefs of the Bovoids and Equinoids unexpectedly entered the competition due to rumors about Rimuru offering the champion title to one of the big four. This led to a surge in monster entries, resulting in over 300 competitors, including the Bovoid and Equinoid leaders, reaching the quarterfinals. Despite the powerful stature, Rimuru found it surprising that both leaders made it so far. He had named Bovix and Equix, respectively, as part of an arrangement to have them serve as bosses in his labyrinth on floor 50. They had pledged their loyalty to Rimuru, prompting him to name them in exchange for their service. Rimuru attempted to hold back his magical energy while naming Bovix and Equix, but they unexpectedly evolved into stronger forms, a Torrid and a Centoid, respectively. Rimuru then considered applying an experimental skill gift to Bovix, which Professor Raphael proposed, aiming to reverse Belzebuth's food chain ability. With Raphael's assistance, Bovix gained the Ultra Speed Regeneration skill, complementing his existing self-regeneration ability while Equix acquired magic interference. Additionally, both monsters received a new ability called Determiner, enhancing their combat capabilities significantly. The Determiner gift allowed its user to create a space that restricted the powers of the target, resembling a combination of Uriel's unlimited imprisonment and dominate space, albeit weaker and easily resisted. However, if the caster was significantly stronger they could still gain an advantage in battle by dragging the target into a dedicated space. Despite its limitations with clever usage, it could be employed defensively or to manipulate opponents. Equix planned to use this skill in the labyrinth to entice adventurers with promises of treasure. Their participation in the tournament stemmed from a bet, the winner joining the big four while the loser became the boss of floor 50. Soka, the announcer, skillfully hyped up the rivalry between Bovix and Equix, adding excitement to the event with her words and charming demeanor. And to add to the excitement, one of these two, either Bovix or Equix, will become a master of the dungeon opening in town tomorrow. Soka enthusiastically promoted the labyrinth, drumming up anticipation for its grand opening. With the strength displayed by Bovix and Equix, many adventurers might be hesitant to challenge it. However, Miramail had plans in place to attract participants with promises of riches and prizes. As for the tournament, much depended on the battles unfolding that day. If one of them faced defeat, it could undermine the dungeon's reputation. Equix was the fifth competitor, leaving three more to go, including the mysterious masked man known as Lion Mask, whose true identity raised concern despite Diablo's assurances. In the arena, there were three guys cheering on Lion Mask, all with unique looks and wearing clothes that declared their admiration for Xion. These were Dagrel's sons, easily recognizable by their distinctive appearance and fan attire. Despite their past defeat by Xion, they had become her biggest fans, which puzzled me. So he explained that they were cheering for Lion Mask because they had lost to him the day before. These guys might seem like jokes, but they still possessed significant magical energy, having once been under a demon lord. Sean was angry at them, but I felt some sympathy, knowing they underestimated their opponent. Facing Lion Mask, who was likely Sean, seemed like an impossible task, but it was unfortunate that all three brothers were matched against him at once. Nevertheless, Sean was determined to train them harder than ever, so we would see how that turned out. Soka received a message from an anonymous supporter cheering on Lion Mask, which she openly shared, hinting at the mystery behind Lion Mask's true identity. Meanwhile, Milam was busy finalizing the labyrinth and seemed to be indirectly meddling in the tournament. As for Veldora, he was kept away to prevent any accidental destruction. With Lion Mask's overwhelming strength, Gel was seen as his strongest competitor, but facing Lion Mask would be tough for anyone. The hope was for Gel to prevail, but it would be a challenge. The six qualifiers from the previous day were introduced, and the anticipation grew as the strongest government officials of Tempest Gobtu and Geld were announced as special entries with the potential to join the prestigious Big Four. This title garnered respect from the audience, reflecting the elevated status of Sean and the others in Rimuru's domain. Soka enthusiastically introduced Gobtu, highlighting his popularity among the girls, though Gobtu seemed nervous facing Lion Mask. Meanwhile, Geld was hailed as the guardian angel of Tempest, known for his strong defense. 
to spike up to being considered a warm-up act compared to Geld, there was hope that he might surprise everyone with hidden strength. As the competitors gathered in the ring, anticipation grew for who would emerge victorious. Rimuru realized he forgot his opening words, but remained composed, delegating tasks to Rigard, Binimaru, and Soi to manage the dignitaries and oversee the arena. Rimuru confidently took the stage, using Dominate Space to make his entrance and receiving thunderous applause from the audience. Taking the mic from Soka, he addressed the competitors, promising glory to those who survived and won. Offering encouragement, he promised Masayuki a chance to challenge him directly, despite Masayuki's apparent reluctance. Turning to Jinrai, he offered a new weapon and armor set as a token of respect for his sportsmanship, acknowledging Jinrai's support for Masayuki. Rimuru aimed to impress the world with his generosity and appreciation for the participants. Rimuru continued interacting with the fighters, facing Guy's bold challenge, and responding with a promise to consider a duel if Guy proved himself. With Diablo's intervention, the situation was diffused, allowing Rimuru to focus on his broader plan. He extended an invitation for others to challenge him after proving their strength by defeating a member of the Big Four. Despite Guy's bravado, Rimuru remained composed, making promises he knew were unlikely to be fulfilled. Rimuru gave some last-minute encouragement to Bovix and Hequix, hoping they would put up a good fight, and not bring shame to their roles as future Labyrinth bosses. Despite their stiff responses, he felt reassured that they were prepared. As for Lion Musk, Rimuru could only offer vague words of caution, hoping luck would be on his side. Gob to receive the pep talk, with Rimuru ignoring his protest, while Gelb was reminded of his strength and expected to perform well. With a mix of hope and uncertainty, Rimuru prepared for the tournament to unfold, knowing that each fighter would demonstrate their abilities in their own way. Then came the drawing for the tournament matchups. Today would feature six fights, leading up to the championship bout tomorrow. Each competitor drew a number randomly, determining their matchups. Bovix drew number one, facing Equix in the first map, while Masayuki lucked out with an easy draw against Genrai. Gai and Gobta would face off, while Gel found himself up against Lion Mask right away. Rimuru couldn't help but feel the matchups were a bit lopsided, particularly with Masayuki's advantageous draw and Gel's tough opponent in Lion Mask. Despite the unfairness, Rimuru knew there was no point in complaining. As the first match was about to begin, the excitement and tension in the arena were palpable. The other fighters stepped out of the arena, leaving Bovix and Equix to face each other. They exchanged heated words, each claiming superiority over the other. Then, the battle began. With axes and shields clashing, they fought fiercely, showing their strength as close-quarters fighters. Despite their endurance, the fight lasted for 20 intense minutes, keeping the audience captivated. Their duel born from a century of rivalry showcased their equal power. However, just when it seemed like the battle would continue indefinitely, it came to a sudden end. It's done! Bovix aimed his powerful axe at Equix, who sacrificed his arm to block the attack. With a swift move, Equix closed the gap and unleashed a flurry of spear strikes, catching Bovix off guard. However, Bovix countered with a lightning-charged headbutt, causing severe injuries to Equix. Despite Equix's self-regeneration ability, the lightning damage overwhelmed him, while Bovix's ultra-speed regeneration quickly healed his wounds. Though both fighters left the arena healed, Bovix emerged victorious. Bovix's impressive victory set the tone for the tournament, showcasing the power of ultra-speed regeneration. Equix learned the importance of caution and strategy for future battles. Match 2 saw Hiro Masayuki facing off against Jinrai the Mad Wolf, ending in a handshake and wild applause from the crowd. Match 3 featured Gai against Gobta, where Gai displayed superior equipment and skill. Gobta struggled to defend himself, and although Gai seemed overconfident, he continuously pressured Gobta without delivering a decisive blow. While Gobta's defensive strategy kept him in the fight, it was clear he was outmatched. Despite Gupta's efforts, the battle seemed to drag on, with Gai showing a lack of sportsmanship. Both Sean and Rimuru found Gai's behavior distasteful, making him root for Gupta, despite his struggles. Gai fought using a sword and gauntlet, making it hard for Gupta to predict his moves. Despite Gai's aggressive attacks, Gupta skillfully defended himself, deflecting sword strikes with his dagger. Sean and Rimuru praised Gupta's observation skills, acknowledging his ability to keep up with Gai's movements. Rimuru even offered Gopta incentives to win, which motivated him to fight harder. As Gai continued to taunt Gopta, Gopta unleashed his secret weapon, summoning the Star Wolf and unifying with it, boosting his strength to match an A-minus monster. With this newfound power, Gopta was ready to turn the tables on Gai and prove himself in the fight. Rimuru was frustrated that Gopta didn't use his summoning ability earlier, 
but he was surprised when Gupta summoned Ranga, who pinned Gai to the ground. Despite Gupta's and Rimuru's confusion, Ranga's unexpected intervention won the match for Gupta. Soka and Diablo declared Gupta the winner, and the crowd cheered, accepting the summoning as a fair move. Gupta wondered if it was allowed, but Rigard assured him that summoning magic was within the rules. Rimuru decided to let go of his worries, seeing Ranga's unexpected participation as potentially advantageous for testing Masayuki's skills. In match 4, Geld faced Lion Mask in an intense battle. Geld decided to fight barehanded, showcasing his mastery of punches and throws while maintaining balance. His fighting style resembled the peekaboo style from boxing, packing immense power into each punch. Lion Mask, equally skilled, unleashed a barrage of attacks including kicks and punches, but Geld's defense remained impenetrable. Despite Lion Mask's varied arsenal and speed, Geld's defensive skills prevailed, frustrating Lion Mask's attempts to land a decisive blow. The match became a thrilling exchange of blows, with Geld admiring Lion Mask's technique while Lion Mask struggled to find an opening against Geld. Solid defense. Geld sensed the tide turning against him as Lion Mask's formidable strength became evident. Lion Mask's attacks were precise and powerful, reminiscent of an attack helicopter cutting through Geld's defenses. Despite the crowd's excitement and passionate cheers, the outcome of the battle remained uncertain. Both fighters exchanged devastating blows, keeping the match evenly matched. Even after 30 minutes of intense combat, neither showed signs of backing down. As Soka enthusiastically provided commentary and Diablo closely monitored the fight, Geld continued to hold his ground. When questioned by Lion Mask about his lack of skill usage, Geld responded that he was waiting for Lion Mask to reveal his true strength. In response, Lion Mask unleashed a flurry of powerful moves, signaling a new phase in the battle. As they continued their intense battle, Rimu listened in through Diablo's ears, puzzled by Geld's reluctance to use his skills. It seemed Geld wanted to secure an unconditional victory against Lion Mask, knowing that Carolyn could unleash his full power through animalization. Aware that Carolyn couldn't reveal his true strength in his current form, Geld opted to fight using only his physical abilities, avoiding the use of his protector or gourmet skills. Despite Carolyn's formidable strength, he refrained from going all out to avoid revealing his identity, as hinted in an anonymous letter read during the introductions. However, Carolyn began to take the fight more seriously, unleashing a powerful attack that struck Geld's weak spot, leaving him battered but determined. As Geld struggled to remain standing, Diablo declared Lion Musk the winner of the match. This match earning massive cheers from the crowd. Despite the loss, Geld earned respect from Carolyn, and they expressed a desire for a future rematch. As Geld left the arena, Rimuru felt proud of him, realizing that the cheers and applause were a testament to the amazing bout they had just witnessed. After the intense quarterfinals, there was a break before the semifinals. As Masaoki and Bovix prepared to fight, there was speculation about Masaoki's true strength. His nerves seemed evident, and sweat dripped down his back. Bovix taunted Masayuki, but Masayuki remained composed, even praising Bovix's skills. However, Masayuki surprised everyone by expressing reluctance to fight at full strength, citing Bovix's fatigue from the previous round. This unexpected gesture sparked a debate about Masayuki's intentions and strategy. Despite praising Bovix, Masayuki subtly hinted at his doubts about Bovix's suitability for a top position. He was a mix of compliments and subtle jabs, leaving everyone curious about Masayuki's true motives. Whoa, what's going on? It seemed like Masayuki wasn't keen on fighting Bovix after all. He proposed a rematch in the dungeon, giving Bovix time to recover. It looked like Masayuki was trying to avoid a confrontation, maybe because Bovix intimidated him. Bovix agreed, claiming he was too tired from his last fight. The crowd loved it, praising Masayuki's generosity and Bovix's wisdom. But something felt off to Rimuru. Was Masayuki just pretending to avoid showing his true strength? Rimuru couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this than met the eye. Regardless, Masayuki advanced to the final, leaving the arena mid cheers. Observing the unfolding match between Gata and Carolyn, Rimuru couldn't help but ponder the potential outcome. If Gata managed an unexpected victory, he could provide the opportunity to unveil Masayuki's true abilities aligning with the initial plan. Thus, the outcome of this match didn't significantly sway their expectations. Cheering fervently for Gubtu, Rimuru hoped for the best. As the battle commenced, Gubtu, unusually determined, made the first move with Ranga by his side. However, Karen's formidable attack, Tega Talon, swiftly altered the course of events. With sharp claws aimed at both Gubtu and Ranga, the situation grew dire. Gubtu's subsequent fall prompted laughter from the crowd, oblivious to the danger Carolyn posed. 
Yet, Ranga's protective stance against Carolyn underscored the seriousness of the situation, despite the audience's amusement. Carolyn intercepted Ranga's attack with his left arm, sacrificing it to block the wolf's bite. Despite this, Ranga persisted, managing to evade Carolyn's subsequent counterattack. The spectators marveled at Ranga's agility, speculating about his true identity. Unbeknownst to them, Ranga was a Tempest Starwolf, a special great creature, far from the ordinary direwolf. Carolyn unleashed another attack, Elephant Stampede, aiming to overwhelm Ranga. However, Ranga cleverly escaped, surprising Carolyn and leaving him momentarily vulnerable. Seizing the opportunity, Gopta, hidden in the shadow, orchestrated Ranga's reappearance, exploiting a loophole to continue the match. A fang narrowly missed Carolyn's head, surprising him, and he instinctively reached for his face as Ranga's attack landed successfully. Although Carolyn remained vigilant, he believed he could endure any attack as long as it wasn't direct. Dodging skillfully, he made it seem effortless, a testament to his mastery of combat. However, Ranga targeted Carolyn's mask, exploiting his momentary lapse in defense to tear it off. Gupta cheered as he seized the opportunity to launch an attack with his dagger, aiming to further expose Carolyn. Despite protests from the crowd about the tactics, Gupta remained defiant, echoing Sir Rimuru's belief in might determining right. He seems a bit clueless, but he's actually pretty clever, you know? Yeah, maybe the Demon Lord gave him the idea. Look at his goofy face. It's scary to think a Demon Lord can control the Big Four, the crowd speculation painted a picture of me as some sort of genius puppeteer, but it's all Gopta's doing really. I didn't want a big four reliant on my guidance, but the crowd didn't understand that. It was frustrating. With Gopta and Ranga taking control, Carolyn's defeat was inevitable when he stepped out of the rain, though he did so gracefully to avoid a scandal. Thanks to an anonymous tip, Gopta's victory was sealed. Soka's excitement stirred the crowd even more, with everyone enjoying the spectacle. Despite being the villain of the day, Gupta's charisma and agile moves endeared him to the audience, making them overlook his underhanded tactics. While Geld and Carolyn's fight was praised for its combat quality, Gupta's antics would be talked about for days to come. This world craved entertainment, and unlike the rule-bound tournament at Inglesia, the Anything Goes vibe of this one seemed to resonate more with people. It might have been a terrible bout objectively, but somehow it managed to capture their hearts in the end. Later on, Ranga approached Rimuru with his tail wagging, expecting praise for his actions. However, Rimuru reprimanded him for joining the match without permission, forbidding him from lurking in his shadow until further notice. Despite feeling conflicted, Rimuru knew he had to set boundaries to avoid reckless behavior. Concerned about Ranga's influence from Xi'an, Rimuru instructed Gupta to work with Ranga and give their all in the final match tomorrow, hoping to settle things peacefully. Rimuru wished they knew more about Masayuki's battle skills, fearing the worst-case scenario if conflict arose. So, day two came to a close with everything in order. The six matches were done, leaving only the finals tomorrow. A surprising showdown between Masayuki and Gopta. After the arena cleared out, the night stall saw big profits, with fans excitedly discussing the day's events. Dinner with the Vips was filled with chatter about the tournament. Gaz's defeat by Gopta made him the talk of the town. Each table enjoyed a kid-friendly menu, chatting freely behind noise-dampening partitions. The excitement about the tournament was palpable, and while there were concerns about tomorrow's final, there was no point worrying too much about it for now. From the next table, Carolyn grinned at the kids' chatter, while Milan seemed a bit annoyed. Despite the noise-dampening partitions, they could hear us just fine. Carolyn boasted about his performance in the tournament, but Milan criticized him for not winning. Midray expressed jealousy for not participating, but Carolyn and I quickly dissuaded Milim from considering it, emphasizing the risks. Milim then suggested watching the final match together, mentioning her completed labyrinth work, while Carolyn planned to explore the town with his friends. Frey asked to join Milim, but Carolyn declined, opting to spend time with his companions instead. As the conversation flowed, Carolyn teased Midre about his absence from the tournament, revealing he spent the day at a concert hall. Frey defended Midre's love for music, igniting a playful banter with Carolyn. Meanwhile the discussion turned to the music they enjoyed, with Carolyn feeling slighted by Frey's remarks. Amidst the chatter, Hinata asked Rimuru about the strategy if they faced Masayuki in combat, prompting a debate among the kids about who would win. Despite the playful argument, Hinata advised caution, emphasizing the uncertainty surrounding Masayuki's strength. And she subtly hinted at Masayuki's formidable strength based on her investigation suggesting even she would find him challenging. Despite this, she playfully boasted about her own abilities, sparking admiration from others and leading to the unanimous conclusion that she would easily defeat Masayuki. 
Rimuru felt a pang of hurt but tried to divert attention by mentioning Masayuki's openness to dialogue. However, he inadvertently triggered tension between himself and Inata by implying something sensitive, leading to a tense moment that he diffused with dessert. Rimuru expressed hope that Masayuki might lose in the upcoming match, acknowledging Gopta's tendency to mess things up at crucial moments. Gopta had potential, but his tendency to veer off course with crazy ideas often undermined his abilities. Despite this, it was hope for him, and Rimuru appreciated Inata's concern for him. If Gopta lost, Rimuru believed they could work through it. But for now, he wanted to enjoy the festival and focus on meeting Gazelle as promised. Rimuru entered the reception room with Benimaru, Sean, and Diablo. Miyomai was already there, looking tense. Shuna welcomed them and prepared drinks. Soon after, Gazelle arrived. They exchanged brief greetings and sat down. Gazelle informed them that he had gathered over 1500 gold coins as requested, the most they could provide without affecting the Dwarven Kingdom's economy. Removing him and apologized for the trouble, but Gazelle assured him it would be sent via heavenly transport the next morning for their convenience. Rimuru thought it was a lot of weight to deliver and considered using his dominate space skill to pick it up from Dwargan instead for safety and certainty. However, the main question remained, would the gathered funds be enough to pay off the merchants? Rimuru calculated that they needed over 3000 gold coins for the festival, the hefty sum equivalent to around 300 million yen in their world's economy. While they had the funds in stellar gold coins, Converting them to regular gold coins was difficult due to the lack of currency circulation. They had around 1,400 gold coins in total, including Gezel's promised funds, but it still fell short. Ezel expressed his surprise at Rimuru's improvised accounting for the festival's budget, but Rimuru admitted they were short on time for proper planning. Despite feeling anxious about Gezel's reaction, Rimuru decided to avoid mentioning their collective enthusiasm for the festival to prevent Gezel's potential anger. Suddenly, Elmija, Emperor of Thalion, along with Archduke Herald, interrupted the conversation. They offered to make up the difference in funds, which surprised Rimuru. Herald explained that Elmija had kindly offered their support due to the friendly relations between their countries. Rimuru hesitated, feeling uneasy about owing Elmija a favor. But Gazel warned him that once she made up her mind, she wouldn't back down easily. Reluctantly, Rimuru accepted the offer, knowing it was better to have Elmija's support than to risk making an enemy out of her. Gazel's reaction despite being the heroic king, also showed his difficulty in dealing with Elmija. Elmija teased Gezel, who seemed uncomfortable with her familiarity. Despite Gezel's attempts to keep the conversation focused, Elmija continued to banter, revealing Gezel's past interactions with her and the shared history. Gezel, usually composed, appeared visibly agitated, which Elmija easily noticed, showing her astute perception. As Amisha asked Shuna a glass of wine, Gezel and Herald exchanged resigned looks, indicating their shared frustration with her behavior. Though they appeared at odds, they shared a common experience of being treated like children by Amisha. Gezel's advice to Rimuru to concede to Amisha's offer reflected his understanding of her influence. As Shuna served Amisha her favorite wine, Gezel and Herald sighed in unison, realizing the inevitability of yielding to her demands. Okay then, Gezel interjected, attempting to redirect the conversation. Let's not waste any more time on frivolous matters, shall we? Elmija, finally acquiescing to Gazel's request, offered her support with one condition. An invitation to future festivals. Despite Gazel and Herald's exasperation, I agreed readily, much to Elmija's delight. Gazel and Herald watched with trepidation as Elmija and I shook hands, forming an unexpected alliance. With a nonchalant demeanor, Elmija produced a purse containing a thousand gold coins, astonishing us all with her casual wealth. Though grateful for her assistance, I couldn't help but feel wary of her power and influence. As Rimuru sat at the table with Gazel, Almija, and others, the conversation took a curious turn. Almija hinted at the possibility of assistance even without the gold coins, suggesting the leverage of indebtedness over coercion. Her words stirred a realization in Rimuru that unseen forces might orchestrate such scenarios to manipulate them. Diablo, quick to grasp the implications, reflected on the potential schemes aimed at undermining the trustworthiness. It was a sobering reminder of the political intricacies at play, prompting Rimuru and the others to remain vigilant against potential manipulation. After successfully securing the gold coins needed, Rimuru felt relieved as the problem was resolved. As they enjoyed their tea, Almeja hinted at the possibility of someone orchestrating the situation to gain favors. This notion intrigued Rimuru, who considered the implications of owing debts to manipulative individuals. Diablo seemed to agree, indicating potential hidden motives behind the merchant's demands. 
Benimaru wondered about the involvement of the Council of the West, prompting Amisha to direct attention to Miyuramayo for insights. Miyuramayo shared rumors of a shadow committee exerting influence over the Council, though he doubted its validity. So his presence went unnoticed until he spoke up, emphasizing the need for caution in their domain due to its unpredictable nature. Amisha approached Rimuru with a serious question, causing him to brace himself for the interaction. She inquired about his plans regarding Diablo, expressing concern over the demon's potential danger. Rimuru, feeling the weight of her scrutiny, assured her that he would intervene if Diablo ever posed a threat. Despite Diablo's apparent satisfaction, with Rimuru's response, Shem voiced surprise at Rimuru's readiness to confront Diablo if needed. Rimuru defended his stance, believing that Diablo had grown more receptive to guidance lately. Rimuru felt reassured by his confidence in Diablo and Shun's behavior, believing they wouldn't cause any trouble. Despite Shun seeming indifferent to the conversation, Rimuru brushed off his concerns. Amisha's laughter drew attention to Rimuru's response, prompting Gezo to express his support, a rare moment of solidarity. Amisha then formalized their friendship with the Jor Tempest Federation, showcasing her authoritative demeanor. However, Rimuru felt puzzled when Amisha warned him not to lose control, shifting the focus onto him unexpectedly. Gezo's reminder of Rimuru's impulsive decision to hold the Founders' Festival made him realize his responsibility. With a nod to Miramile, Rimuru acknowledged his role in the decision-making process. Miramile insisted it wasn't Rimuru's idea to hold the Founders' Festival without consulting them first, prompting Rimuru to promise to involve them in future decisions. Gezel and Amisha's advice wasn't typical for foreign leaders, but they stressed the importance of communication for smoother relations. Rimuru saw this as an opportunity for mutual benefit, especially in preparing for future threats. Transitioning from the gold coin problem to diplomatic discussions felt like a relief, with Almija pledging to strengthen their ties. Just as Rimuru thought the night was ending, Almija unexpectedly asked to meet Mr. Yoshida, causing a minor stir. Rimuru agreed to introduce them, emphasizing not to pressure Yoshida. With that settled, the impromptu summit concluded peacefully. On the morning of day three, Rimuru had already sorted out the gold coin issue by exchanging stellars at the Dwarven Kingdom. Now with worries set aside, it was time to enjoy the festival again. The highlight of the day was the tournament final between Masayuki and Gobti, drawing a lively crowd at the Colosseum. Rimuru had placed a bet on Gobti, secretly hoping to earn some extra money, but also to cheer for the Hobbublin. Soka's enthusiastic commentary added to the excitement, while Diablo's presence seemed to attract attention from some of the female spectators. Regardless of the outcome, Rimuru saw the map as an opportunity to gauge Masaoki's true skill and assess any potential threats. With Ranga by Gobta's side and Luck on his side, Rimuru eagerly awaited the start of the fight to see how much Gobta could push Masaoki. Masayuki was really scared. He saw how tough Bullocks and Ekrix were in their fight, and he knew he had to face the winner. That thought terrified him. He managed to talk Bovix into quitting, but then he realized he'd have to fight someone even scarier. He couldn't eat or sleep, feeling like he was waiting to be punished. He realized he had been too confident, relying too much on his friends and thinking they were unbeatable. But now, facing this challenge, he felt trapped. His friends believed he could win, but he was terrified and didn't know how to defend himself. Despite his fear, he pretended to be confident for his friends, even though deep down, he was shaking. As the final round approached, Masayuki felt his nerves getting worse. He kept going to the bathroom to make sure he wouldn't embarrass himself in the arena. Facing him was Gobta, a fighter who seemed confident and cool. But Masayuki couldn't see how Hobbablin could be a tough opponent. The announcer hyped up the match, and Masayuki felt the pressure mounting. He wished he could understand his unique skill, chosen one, better. It seemed to make people see him as stronger than he really was. Maybe it could help him win again, like it did with Bovix. As he looked at Gobta, he noticed the Hobbablin seemed nervous, too. Masayuki hoped this meant he had a chance to win without even fighting, but he knew he'd have to be careful and think things through. At the start of the battle, Gupta charged forward, surprising Masayuki. But instead of attacking, Gupta slid past him and took a defensive position. Masayuki didn't seem bothered at all, which made Gupta feel ignored and insecure about his own appearance. Meanwhile, Masayuki seemed confident and unfazed, which frustrated Gupta. Determined to show his strength, Gopta decided to use a new power he had recently acquired, Summon Demon Wolf, but he hadn't practiced with it yet, making it risky to use in front of everyone. Wait, so Gopta could combine with Ranga? How'd he do that? Was Raphael about to say something last night, but didn't? Maybe Raphael helped Gopta learn this new skill. Raphael didn't deny it, which made things suspicious. Gopta then transformed, merging with Ranga to become a cool bipedal creature. It looked awesome and even Milam was excited. 
Diablo explained that it's a rare skill to infuse your body with a summoned creature's power. As the match unfolded, the crowd watched with bated breath as Gobta unveiled his newfound power, harnessing the strength of the creature he summoned previously. Rimuru, observing from the VIP boxes, whispered in awe, trying to comprehend the significance of Gobta's transformation. Others around him expressed admiration for Gobta's ability to wield Ranga's power, seeing potential for his growth as a fighter. Meanwhile, the tension heightened as Gupta disappeared from view, prompting gasps from the audience. Then, a sudden explosion near the VIP box startled everyone, leaving Rimuru feeling a mix of amazement and envy towards Gupta's evolving prowess. From his vantage point, Rimuru witnessed Gupta's attempt to utilize his newfound power, only to fail spectacularly as he collided with the wall, rendering himself unconscious. It was evident that Gupta lacked control over his transformation, leading to his unfortunate mishap. Despite initial excitement over his abilities, Gobda's clumsiness became apparent, leaving Rimuru and others around him stunned and disappointed. Binimaru, Sean, and Hakuro expressed their disbelief and amusement, while the tension among them grew palpable. Observers in the crowd struggled to make sense of the chaotic turn of events, highlighting Gobda's unfortunate predicament. As murmurs of amazement filled the arena, Misaki's victory was celebrated with thunderous applause, despite Soka and Diablo being caught off guard. However, nearby, Rimuru's neighbors simmered with frustration over Gupta's disappointing performance. Milim, visibly upset, expressed her displeasure while Hakuro and others vowed to take a stricter approach with Gupta in the future. Milim eager to train Gupta, proposed her plan, but Rimuru countered with a request to explore ancient ruins in Clayman's domain, seeking Milim's permission. After, Rimuru clarified Milim's authority over the domain before swiftly securing her permission for the exploration of ancient ruins. Though Gopta's mishap was unfortunate, Rimuru saw an opportunity to make the best out of the situation, aiming to benefit from the agreement with Milim. Despite the setback, Rimuru remained focused on the positive outcome of gaining permission for the expedition. As discussions concluded, Soka prepared to announce the winner. As Gupta initiated his transformation, Masayuki realized he was caught off guard and ill-prepared for what was about to happen. Feeling vulnerable in his inadequate armor, Masayuki contemplated the dire situation he found himself in. As Gupta charged forward, Masayuki contemplated surrendering to preserve his life, but events unfolded too quickly for him to react. Gupta's self-destruction left Masayuki stunned and wounded, facing the harsh reality of his situation. Masayuki acknowledged the futility of challenging the demon lord Rimuru and decided it was best to flee rather than face certain defeat. He had to act fast to ensure Gupta didn't lose the match. Masayuki's mind raced as he scrambled to find a way for himself to lose while keeping safe. Just as the judgment was about to be announced, Masayuki intervened, pretending to concede defeat. With shaky words, he explained to Soka that he couldn't keep up with Gopta's attack and lacked the experience to challenge a demon lord. Sweating profusely and trying to sound convincing, Masayuki left the arena without looking back, relying on his skill to make his excuse seem believable to the crowd. Focusing solely on escaping his dangerous situation, Masayuki hurriedly left the scene, relieved to have avoided a potentially deadly outcome. Gupta lay on the ground while Masayuki unexpectedly declared his loss, leaving everyone puzzled about his motives. Binimaru and Sean couldn't figure out what was going on either. Some speculated that Masayuki couldn't muster the courage to face the Demon Lord, while others thought he might be injured. A man in the crowd proposed that Masayuki's actions were a warning to Rimuru, suggesting that Masayuki deliberately conceded to convey a message. This idea gained traction among the spectators, with some interpreting Masayuki's refusal to draw his sword as a sign of his confidence and readiness to challenge the Demon Lord if needed. People in the crowd praised Masayuki, believing he forfeited the match to send a message rather than out of fear or incompetence. They chanted his name like a religious mantra, which puzzled Rimuru. Raphael, however, explained that Masayuki possessed a unique skill that influenced people's thoughts and feelings. This revelation shed light on Masayuki's behavior throughout the tournament, suggesting that he lacked combat prowess but compensated with his skill's influence. Despite his apparent weakness, it was clear that underestimating him would be a mistake considering the potential danger of being his enemy. Rimuru contemplated staying on Masayuki's good side, recognizing the need to handle him cautiously, especially given his upcoming rematch with Bolix. Rimuru decided to extend sympathy and support to Masayuki, planning to meet him for lunch and discuss further opportunities. Meanwhile, Gupta regained consciousness and despite Masayuki's withdrawal, he was declared the champion. While some in the crowd expressed disappointment, most accepted the outcome. Gupta, though considered the heel, received praise from the announcer. 
After the tournament, Rimuru presented awards to all competitors and fulfilled promises, including giving equipment to Masaoki's friend. Gupta received praise from Rimuru and was appointed to the Big Four, a role that would allow Rimuru to tease him affectionately. However, Gupta's journey was far from over as Milim eagerly announced her intention to train him, rigorously. Despite Rimuru's concern, Milan's enthusiasm for intense training, even within the labyrinth, raised doubts about Gobda's future challenges. When Milan approached him, she displayed her immense strength, signaling the tough training ahead for Gobda, leaving him uncertain. Milan was thrilled by Gobda's transformation but became furious when he acted foolishly afterward, leading her to decide to personally train him to become stronger. Despite Gobda's protest, Akiro insisted he embraced the opportunity, leaving Gopta feeling helpless. Ranga, realizing the situation, distanced himself from the conflict, knowing Milam's determination. Dragging both Gopta and Ranga along, Milam declared them her trainees, determined to improve their skills. Observing this, Rimuru reflected on Gopta's reliance on luck and Ranga's instinctive fighting style, hoping that Milam's training would help refine their abilities and transform them into formidable warriors. As they departed, Rimuru bid them farewell, acknowledging their courage and silently wishing them well. It was lunchtime, and Rimuru was about to have a meal with Masaoki. Masaoki introduced himself nervously, mentioning nicknames like Lightspeed and The Hero, which seemed embarrassing to him. Rimuru understood Masaoki's unease, especially considering his past promise to defeat a demon lord like Rimuru. Despite any apprehension, Rimuru assured Masaoki that he didn't need to fear him, emphasizing their shared Japanese background. Masaoki seemed surprised by this, perhaps because Rimuru looked like a cute girl at the moment. Nonetheless, Rimuru hoped that their meal together would help resolve any lingering tension between them. Masayuki seemed a bit hesitant as he sat down for lunch with Rimuru. He cautiously asked if the food was suitable for him to eat, showing a hint of uncertainty. Rimuru reassured him and explained that the meal was Japanese cuisine hoping it would be a pleasant surprise for Masayuki. As Masayuki tasted the food, his demeanor shifted and he became engrossed in eating. After finishing his meal, Masayuki unexpectedly expressed his willingness to become Rimuru's servant, citing his desire to escape the expectations of being called a hero. Rimuru was taken aback by the sun declaration. Masayuki shared his background with Rimuru, revealing that he was a bright student in his old world, attending a prestigious high school. He confessed his love for manga and light novels, which he kept hidden from others. Masayuki expressed frustration with his skill, chosen one which he believed led him to become a hero against his will. This skill allowed him to influence people's thoughts, leading to his success in various endeavors without much effort. However, the recent tournament made him realize the dangers of relying solely on his skill, prompting him to seek a reality check. Rimuru reassured Masayuki that his decision to withdraw from the championship was the right one and despite his skill's drawbacks, he should be proud of his choice. Masayuki wondered if his skill would affect Rimuru, but Rimuru assured him that ultimate skills like his were unaffected. Rimuru, although having some doubts, acknowledged Masayuki's decision. They continued chatting, with Masayuki opening up about his life while Rimuru listened attentively. Masayuki revealed his frustration with his friend's idolization of him and the lack of someone to confide in except for Yuki, who he rarely had time to meet. Rimuru encouraged Masayuki to consider his next steps, reminding him of his promise to remat Bovis in the dungeon challenge. Rimuru assured Masayuki that he could delay facing the dungeon for a few days, as most dignitaries would leave town by then. Rimuru also hinted at using Masayuki as a promotional tool for the dungeon, wanting him to encourage others to take on the challenge. I want you to help me grab people's attention, Rimuru asked Masayuki. Masayuki felt reassured, understanding that Jinrai's gift of equipment was meant for his safety in the dungeon. He eagerly agreed to support Rimuru's plans and promised to leak hints about conquering the dungeon. Rimuru advised him to reach floor 5 and not venture beyond floor 50 to maintain fairness. Masayuki compared the situation to beta testing a game and expressed gratitude for their conversation, feeling more at ease in this world. Rimuru shared his plans for cultural development, including manga, which excited Masayuki. They decided to stay in touch regularly, with Masayuki expressing a desire to follow Rimuru wherever he went, cementing their newfound friendship. Rimuru decided to make a final check on the dungeon before its opening. Ramaris and Veldor assured him that everything was in order, but their confidence didn't ease Rimuru's worries. He reminded them about closing the labyrinth after the unveiling and planned to discuss the details with Miramai later. Despite leaving some final details to Ramiris and Veldora, Rimu acknowledged that it might have been a mistake given their lack of attention during meetings. However, 
He remained calm and assured them that he would do his best to open the labyrinth officially soon. Rin Muru then inquired about Milan's whereabouts and learned that she had taken control over certain floors, including dragon chambers, and was investing effort into them. This conversation revealed Milan's involvement in the dungeon's management and her plans for raising dragons. Ramira seemed cheerful, even finding some positive aspects in Milan. Milam was seen carrying dragons, which initially shocked people but became accepted over time. She had captured four elemental arch dragons, and Ramirez had put callers on them to establish a clear master and servant relationship. Milam was currently in the dragon chambers, providing playmates for the dragons to keep them active. Despite Veldor's desire to wait for challenges, Rimuru convinced him to come up top as they prepared to open the labyrinth. With encouragement, Rimuru and Ramirez teleported to the chamber at the top. After lunch, Rimuru and Ramaris greeted the arriving guests including Diablo who had finished his duties as referee. Rimuru had high hopes for the dungeon's opening, considering it a crucial part of the nation's development. As the hall filled up, Rimuru saw Soka and Mirama preparing to announce the event. Mirama took the stage, introducing the dungeon as Tempest's greatest achievement and a challenge for adventurers. Due to safety concerns with such a large crowd, they opted to showcase the dungeon's progress on a large screen instead of taking everyone inside. This required some technological setup, but they were confident after their success with similar displays at the battle tournament. The projector built by Garbill and Bester was handy, used for various tasks including displaying battles by a video recording crystal ball with magical communication spells. This ensured the safety of the royal guests as only selected parties would explore the labyrinth. Soka then invited adventurous audience members to step forward, prompting Rimuru and Ramaris to summon a temporary doorway to the labyrinth on stage. The crowd was excited, and Rimuru hoped for many volunteers including Masaoki's group, who were already briefed and ready. Surprisingly, Basan and his friends eagerly volunteered, determined to uncover the truth behind the Demon Lord's labyrinth and showcase their strength as the Great Lightning Team. Looks like there were various challengers, including Basan, who missed the tournament. Despite knowing the strength of the competitors, he believed they were invincible. Basin's group aimed to expose the labyrinth as a scam. Sean and Diablo were ready to intervene, but Rimu saw potential in them for the job. As Basin and his group prepared to enter the labyrinth, three unexpected challenges emerged from the audience including Elen. Elen's trio was aiding Yom in founding his new nation, traveling to various free guild locations in the former Pharmas. They were rated as B-plus adventurers, allowing them to cross borders freely. Despite not accompanying Yom initially, they surprised Rimuru with their decision. Meanwhile, Masayuki's party including Jinrai and Nuama, confidently entered the stage, greeted by applause. Masayuki received a rapier as a gift as he confessed his discomfort with heavier swords. In this world, katanas weren't as common, so swords tended to be weightier. Masayuki struggled even to hold a sword steady, so I gave him a lightweight rapier, a discarded version of another sword, minus its lethal 7th attack trait. With the rapier, posing was easier for him, and it helped reduce exhaustion. His party, now equipped with the rapier, basked in the audience's cheers. They, along with two other parties, were to explore the labyrinth within a three-hour time limit, advertising it in the process. Just as the demonstration was about to start, Gai, a swordsman, appeared, accusing Rimuru of foul play and vowing to thwart their plans. Despite Diablo's desire to confront him, Rimuru discouraged it, and Shion's sarcastic remark added to the tension. Nonetheless, Rimuru decided to let Gaia enter the labyrinth alone to see how he fares, adding him as the fourth party for the day. With the challenges ready, it was time to open the dungeon. Soka would stay to commentate while the Dryads, Trainee, Treya, and Doroth would accompany each party, serving as guides and cameramen. I named them Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta for convenience. They distributed items to each party, including high potions, a full potion, resurrection bracelets, and return whistles. These were provided for free during the beta test, and the dryads carried backup items. Soka explained the rules, emphasizing the importance of the resurrection bracelet, which revived you inside the dungeon but not outside. She ensured everyone understood the limitations, especially the audience. Then, the adventure began with parties exploring the labyrinth, aiming to entertain the audience for the next three hours and using their items to return afterward. As a reward, treasure chests containing souvenirs were placed, with better rewards on higher floors during normal operation. Making sure everyone understood that the resurrection bracelet only worked inside the labyrinth was crucial to avoid any accidents. If someone tried to use it outside, it wouldn't work, and we couldn't be held responsible for that. Soka emphasized this point repeatedly, 
leaving no room for misunderstanding. Ramiris had improved the bracelets to teleport users back instantly upon death, providing a 10 second window for assistance. Full potions could revive people in the labyrinth by restoring their bodies, but they wouldn't work outside. It was important not to encourage this behavior to avoid confusion. Overall, exploring the dungeon was like playing a video game, where you had to follow the rules to stay safe. With the initial briefing done, Soka asked if anyone wanted to test the resurrection bracelet but nobody volunteered. Even Bass and the big guy thought it was too risky. Gaia suggested Miramail try it first, pointing at him. Despite the hesitation, Miramail agreed, having already experienced it once before. As he entered the labyrinth, Gaia suddenly attacked him, cutting off his arm. Despite the shock, Miramai remained calm, and as Gaia prepared for the final blow, Miramai smiled. When Gaia struck, Miramai's body dissolved into light particles and reformed, fully restored, showcasing the power of the resurrection bracelet. Alpha and the other dryads recorded everything with their crystal balls, displaying it on the large screen for everyone to see. Miramai stood there unharmed, even though he had just been killed. The audience was amazed, cheering and calling it a miracle. Thanks to Gaia's unexpected violence, people were now more convinced of the Resurrection Bracelet's power. Rimuru knew there would still be skeptics, but experiencing it firsthand would be the best way to convince them. As long as adventurers took care not to die, they had nothing to fear in the labyrinth. Rimuru trusted that adventurers would spread the word, and maybe some curious ones would even test the bracelet themselves. Miramile's bravery and enduring Gaia's actions had helped demonstrate the bracelet's effectiveness. Rimuru made a mental note to thank him later as he watched the scene on the screen. Soka started her commentary as the screen displayed the viewpoints of all four parties exploring the labyrinth. Bassin's party caught my attention first as they ventured through the corridors of full one without making any marks or maps. They seemed to be getting lost, despite the warnings about the dungeon's size. Their struggle was evident as they realized the maze was much larger than they expected. While I didn't want them to face immediate danger, it was crucial for them to make some progress to keep the challenge enticing. The parties had options for assistance, including in Sauce feature in their bracelets and the dryads accompanying them, ready to bring them back to the surface if needed. Asin's party struggling with navigation and attributing their difficulties to illusory magic rather than their own lack of preparation. Despite their attempts to follow a rule of always turning right, they found themselves unexpectedly falling through trapdoors to the next level. This development surprised both Rimuru and Soka, as trapdoors weren't part of the initial design for the first floor. Upon questioning Ramiris, it became clear that she had added trapdoors to increase the labyrinth's challenge. However, this addition inadvertently provided shortcuts rather than hindrances, highlighting the importance of aligning traps with the intended difficulty level. In the scenario, Rimuru didn't appreciate Ramiris' decision to install trapdoors on the upper levels of the dungeon. He preferred a more welcoming approach for adventurers at the beginning. Meanwhile, he directed his focus to Elen's group, led by Kabul but now entirely commanded by Elen herself. They proceeded cautiously, meticulously noting their surroundings and avoiding traps. Rimuru found their progress suspiciously smooth, prompting him to question Ramiris, who confessed to receiving gifts from Elen's group. As Rimuru pondered the implications of Ramiris's meddling, his headache intensified. In the labyrinth's midst, Elen had gifted Ramiris a plethora of cakes baked by Mr. Yashida in exchange for information about the first floor. Ramiris, enchanted by the pastries, didn't see it as a problem, despite it being bribery. Though frustrated by the corruption, Rimuru reassured himself that he had adjusted the labyrinth's difficulty and limited Elen's influence to the first floor. Meanwhile, Cabal's party efficiently collected treasure, with Miramal explaining the different types of chests and their contents. Soka and Miramal discussed the allure of gold chests found on boss chamber floors, enticing adventurers with the promise of rare weapons and armor, highlighting the labyrinth's challenges and rewards for those brave enough to venture deeper. That's right, and one more thing. Each floor is really big. It might take several days to clear the dungeon, huh? As Soka and Miramal were smoothly commentating together, asking and answering questions. Floor 1 only had bronze chests, and Rimuru checked with Ramiris to ensure they hadn't tampered with them. Although he didn't appreciate Elen's tactics, her party was progressing well, serving as effective advertising. Despite violating rules by giving hints, Rimuru overlooked it. Meanwhile, Masayuki's party swiftly reached Floor 4, having encountered many trapdoors. The crowd cheered for Masayuki's success, despite it being unfair due to his special abilities. Rimuru hoped they would manage the challenges ahead even though his map might not be reliable anymore. That just left Guy, and he was using his physical gifts to rush through the labyrinth, with Delta flying at full speed to keep up. Delta, being a demi-spiritual being, could teleport using nearby plants, but she stuck to following Guy to maintain a live video fee. 
Guy seemed to have a magical positioning system called Automap, guiding him effortlessly through the maze. This spell provided him with precise location data, similar to what the Great Sage once provided to Rimuru. Gai's swift progress indicated his proficiency not only in swordsmanship but also in magic. Despite being on floor 2, he was moving quickly, reaching floor 5 much sooner than expected. However, there was something odd about Gai's behavior. His intense greed and ruthless actions suggested he was not the typical adventurer. Rimu observed him with caution, hoping to avoid any further involvement with him. Two hours had passed, and Basson's group stumbled upon a hidden chamber. Inside, they found a monster guarding a silver chest. Despite their previous setbacks with traps and mimics, they cautiously approached the chest. Ramirez assured Rimuru that this time, they would find something valuable. However, upon realizing the presence of the monster, Basson and his team hesitated, feeling intimidated. Despite being rated B and facing only a C-ranked monster, they were wary. Finally, they decided to confront the bear, gearing up for a fight to claim the treasure chest. Basson, leading the charge, engaged the giant bear head-on while his teammates provided support. Despite their cautious approach, they managed to defeat the monster in about five minutes without any injuries. However, Rimuru couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off. Soka and Miramail commented on the battle's professionalism, but Rimuru couldn't understand why they were so careful when they could have easily won. Reflecting on the situation, Rimuru realized that the adventurer's approach differed from what he expected, causing him some concern about the effectiveness of his pitch for the labyrinth. Wow. It seems like some adventurers might need a few days just to finish the first floor," remarked Rimuru, feeling concerned about the unexpected challenges faced by Basson's party on floor 2. Despite their victory against the giant bear, Rimuru couldn't help but worry about their slow progress. As Sukha built up the anticipation for the opening of the silver chest, Rimuru observed with a mixture of frustration and concern as Basson's party members took turns opening it without caution. Unlike Elen's more sensible approach, who had a skilled thief to avoid traps, Recognizing the need for expertise, Rimuru pondered whether Basson's team should recruit a specialist or expand their ranks to improve their exploration efficiency. But maybe the labyrinth was tougher than Rimuru first thought. Despite Basson's crew being considered low level, the lack of experienced dungeon explorers slowed their progress. They finally stumbled upon a rare sword in a treasure chest, a much needed win after a string of bad luck. Veldora's adjustment to increase the chances of such finds on floor 2 helped boost morale, despite Basson's initial struggles. With the new weapon in hand, Basson's party gained confidence and swiftly dispatched the monsters ahead, collecting valuable magic crystals along the way. Excited by their success, they eagerly looked forward to future visits to the dungeon, now with a more optimistic outlook. Rimuru shifted focus to a lens group, noticing their cautious approach on floor 1, which paid off with numerous chests. Suddenly, they decided to change tactics and head for deeper levels, aiming for floor 10 within the hour. Their focus on floor 1 was likely to gather potions, but now they aimed to utilize Ramaris's information for a deeper dive. Observers speculated on their strategy, questioning if they aimed for chests with better rewards. While rare items could come from silver chests, they were unpredictable. Gold chests, found mainly in boss monster chambers, guaranteed rare items. However, there were also area bosses throughout the labyrinth, guarding rooms that might contain golden chests. Encouraged by Sokka's and Miramal's advice, Rimuru questioned Ramiris about leaking the locations of area bosses. Ramiris admitted to the possibility, causing concern. However, Rimuru decided to stay optimistic, seeing potential PR benefits. He recalled placing an area boss on floor 4, housing giant bats, a lens party. Aware of the bats, pretended to be injured, showcasing potion effects, and acted to approach the monster lair. Their performance impressed Rimuru, likening them to theater actors. Inside the lair, Cabo reluctantly faced the bats but remained calm, using his durable shield to fend off their attacks effortlessly. As Elen distracted the bats, she cast a magic spell, Icicle Shot, using her dryad staff to amplify its power, and swiftly defeat them. Rimuru and Ramirez observed the ease of the battle, noting that it would have been much harder for Basson's party. Despite the success, Rimuru couldn't help but feel that awarding a gold chest for such an easy victory was costly. However, Ramirez reminded him not to judge other parties by Elen's standards. When Guido opened the gold chest, revealing a sword inside, Elen expressed disappointment while Cabo showed enthusiasm. Miyomail hyped up the find, stating that every gold chest guaranteed an excellent item, which amused Rimuru, even though he didn't remember saying it. That sword called the Tempest Sword, even more rare than they thought, it was actually unique. Veldora had increased the chances of finding such valuable items for the day, which explained why Len's party got lucky. 
with their mission accomplished, they prepared to leave, their focus solely on gaining riches. Meanwhile, Masayuki's team was racing through the labyrinth, already reaching the ninth floor within two hours. Despite some unexpected challenges, they were far ahead, swiftly defeating monsters and advancing. Their speed was impressive, reaching the tenth floor with plenty of time left. However, they faced a formidable black spider boss in the last chamber, causing them to brace themselves for the battle. Yinra swiftly defeated the black spider with a single slash, frustrating him as Masayuki's team made quick work of the boss. Despite the annoyance caused by the trapdoors, they secured a rare level dagger from the gold chest and marked their names at the floor safe point. Afterwards, they used a the return whistle to head back, becoming the second group to emerge from the labyrinth after Elen's team. As they exited, Gab prepared to challenge the boss alone, impressing the audience with his swift progress and unique approach. While some found Gaz's personality grating, his rank was well deserved, despite encountering no problems so far. He aimed to defeat the boss before its resurrection in approximately 30 minutes. With only 15 minutes left, Guy, upon realizing he might not have enough time to challenge, the boss erupted in anger, displaying his arrogance and greed. Despite Delta's attempts to calm the situation, Guy's disrespectful remarks escalated, leading Delta to enforce the rules of the labyrinth. Ignoring her warning, Guy faced punishment as vines bound and inflicted pain upon him. Delta, using thornbind magic, demonstrated her authority and gave Guy a final chance to apologize. Gaia's protestations were abruptly silenced as Delta swiftly severed his head with her hands. Despite his status as an erranked adventurer, Gaia stood no chance against Delta, a dryad whose innate abilities surpassed his own. The shocking display left the crowd stunned, emphasizing the authority of the Labyrinth's master. Miramile explained that disobeying the master's rules resulted in swift punishment, as seen with Gaia's fate. Stripped of his acquired items and left unconscious upon resurrection, Guy faced consequences for his disrespect towards Delta and Mirama. Witnessing his downfall brought a sense of satisfaction, hoping it served as a lesson for him. Mirama explained further, the resurrection bracelet works smoothly as long as everyone obeys the rules. But Sir Guy deliberately broke the rules, so the labyrinth has strict rules for visitors, like no fighting among adventurers, and always listening to the maze managers. We'll give out rule books and summaries to those who can't read. It's important to follow the rules to avoid ending up like Gai. Soka then reassured everyone, explaining that during normal times, bosses reappear after a short wait. She emphasized the importance of conquering the dungeon without conflicts. Though some awkwardness lingered, seeing Gai awake and frustrated helped ease tensions. Despite Gai's behavior, his journey provided valuable lessons on handling high-level adventurers and ensuring everyone understood the rules. Overall, it was a satisfactory outcome for everyone involved. So all the teams finished their turns, leaving only Basson's group inside with about 10 minutes left. Suddenly, one of Basson's friends screamed and fell down with an arrow through his eye. A skeleton in the room was shooting arrows through the door, taking down another member. The rest of the group quickly defeated the skeleton. Soka, the commentator, kept the audience engaged, explaining the situation. People were really into watching the action on the big screen, reacting with screams and shouts. Maybe hosting viewing events like this could be fun. Despite their earlier doubts, Basson's group turned out to be good challengers, focused on the task at hand. However, they seemed to have the wrong impression about the labyrinth and weren't great at following instructions, though they were helpful as beta testers. In the aftermath of their adventure, Alpha, the guide for Basson's group, decisively interrupted their morning, signaling it was time to return to the surface. Despite Basson's initial protest, Alpha ensured their return. Back on the surface, Basson's companion expressed surprise at being alive again, which lifted Basson's spirits. They engaged in excited chatter, marveling at the resurrection magic and discussing their future adventures. Although one member had lost an eye, they quickly remedied it with a potion and eagerly anticipated their next exploration. Despite their less cautious approach, the crowd witnessed their safe return, marking the day's adventure as a successful advertisement for the dungeon's safety. All the challenges were now lined up on stage as Rimuru stepped forward to offer some closing remarks. Holding a mic, Rimuru asked them if they had fun and invited them to try the dungeon when it officially opens. He even teased that if anyone could conquer the hundredth floor, they could challenge him to a battle. With that, the event concluded, and Rimuru felt satisfied with how it went. However, his moment was interrupted by Veldora the Lord of the Labyrinth, who complained about not seeing any challenges. 
Rimuru scolded Veldera for not paying attention and lectured him until he understood his mistake. It was like seeing kids getting scolded at a fair, a common occurrence that Rimuru found regrettable but necessary. On the final night of the festival, everyone gathered for a big feast, with Shuna and Mr. Yashida working hard to make it special. The atmosphere was cheerful, with nobles chatting and laughing together, showing how they had become friends over the past few days. Meanwhile, Veldora, Ramiris, and Nilam were having fun in the labyrinth, while Trainee and the elves kept them entertained. Then town merchants, adventurers, farmers, and residents all came together to enjoy food, drink, and music. It was bittersweet knowing the festival would end, but seeing everyone happy made it all worthwhile. As the night went on, the happiness in the air filled Rimuru with hope for lasting peace in the future. And so, the night continued. The festival had ended, and people were heading home along the highways, led by Rigor and his security team. Rigor took his job seriously, unlike Gopta, ensuring smooth travel for our VIP guests. Meanwhile, over a hundred merchants awaited payment in the main meeting hall. Rigor and Miramai were managing the situation, but it was time for Rimuru to step in. As Rimu entered the hall, he could hear arguments brewing outside about delayed payments. He knew he needed to handle this situation carefully. Some of Miramai's merchant friends tried to calm down the tradesmen demanding payment, showing their support. Then, Duke Muse from the Kingdom of Gaston intervened, assuring everyone that the debts would be paid according to international regulations. This Duke, despite being a powerful noble, was courteous in handling the negotiations. Miramai, although not holding an official title, was treated with respect by the Duke receiving what seemed like royal treatment. It was unusual for a noble to remember a commoner's name, but this gesture surprised everyone, especially Miramile, who knew how nobility typically operated. Duke Muse urged Miramile to prioritize trust in business dealings, insisting on the importance of keeping promises. Despite Miramile's attempts to explain their situation, the Duke interrupted, suggesting a private discussion. This move seemed to resolve the issue. Reflecting a situation Rimuru had anticipated, feeling confident, Rimuru intervened accompanied by Benimaru, Shon, and Diablo to address the matter directly with the merchants who were causing a disturbance. Apologies for the oversight. The sight of Rimuru entering the room surprised the merchants, their expressions turning pale as they were unsure how to react. Rigard urged them to bow, but only a few complied, while the rest remained seated, giving Rimuru curious looks. Despite the tension, Rimuru reassured them there was no need for formality and smiled as he addressed the situation. Among the crowd, he noticed journalists in disguise, likely ready to report on any scandal. However, they were prepared as Diablo had already been informed about their presence. Despite his intimidating demeanor, Rimuru let Diablo handle the situation with the press. Duke Muse greeted Rimuru politely and he responded confidently, smoothly navigating the encounter with advanced preparation. Duke Muse boldly claimed that he was there to protect the rights of the tradesmen who were allegedly neglected during the festival. Rimuru calmly questioned the validity of their claims, pointing out that the budget was sufficient for payments. However, Duke Muse argued that the tradesmen only accepted dwarven gold coins, citing international commercial law. Despite his seemingly fair approach, Rimuru sensed that Duke Muse had ulterior motives and exchanged a knowing glance with Diablo. Vinimuru intervened, causing unease among the merchants who feared Rimuru might resort to coercion. Nonetheless, Rimuru decided to hear out the merchant's concerns before taking further action. The audience seemed surprised when Rimuru held Binimaru back, disrupting the smooth proceedings. Rimuru questioned why the merchants refused Tempest made goods as an alternative to dwarven coins, but Duke Muse proposed trust in Tempest and suggested accepting eyes were equivalent goods. Mirama hoped for a quick resolution, but the merchants remained adamant about dwarven gold coins, disregarding Rimuru's suggestions. Their responses showed a lack of consideration for Rimuru's position leaving him disappointed with the outcome. Muse felt the moment was right. He was confident the merchants would heed his instructions, being a prince from Gaston with ties to the powerful Rosso family. His plan, orchestrated by the eldest Rosso family member aimed to make the demon lord Rimuru owe him a favor, promising him a promotion to the five elders in return. Though facing Rimuru was daunting, the prospect of glory outweighed his fears. Musi's strategy involved persuading the merchants and controlling the situation to earn Rimuru's gratitude. Surprised to see Rimuru and his staff in person, Muse adapted his approach, ready to execute his plan and bask in his impending success. As predicted Duke Muse, they attempted to intervene with a poorly executed offer. However, upon seeing Geld enter with the tray of gold coins Muse's expression shifted, realizing his plan had failed. Rigard confirmed that the payment was in dwarven gold coins, leaving the audience in shock. 
Muse, now panicked, accused the coins of being counterfeit, drawing a cold response from Rimuru and his advisors. Diabo and Benimaru stepped forward, ready to confront any further objections, while Shum loomed behind Rimuru. Rimuru Kami suggested having the coins appraised if Muse doubted their authenticity. In that case, I'll use my magic tools to examine them. The protege of Duke Muse spoke up, attempting to interrupt the conversation. It seemed he forgot his manners, likely rattled by the unfolding events. Shuna, following the plan, communicated with Rimuru about the reporters waiting outside, ready to witness the appraisal. Binimaru suggested letting the press in, and as expected they entered the hall just in time. With their confirmation of the coin's authenticity and impressive value, the colluding merchant had no choice but to accept. Under the reporter's scrutiny, Rigard and Miramile proceeded with the payment process smoothly, settling the merchant's concerns. And you're the last one, then, Rimuru said, concluding their business for the founder's festival. Duke Mies looked stiff, bewildered by the piles of dwarven gold coins. The colluding merchant tried to smooth things over, expressing hope for future business, but Rimuru declined, surprising both the merchants and their staff. As the merchants protested, Shun intervened with quiet anger, reminding them of Rimuru's status as king. Rimuru explained that trust is a two-way street and expressed disappointment in the merchants' lack of faith, despite Miyama's efforts to reassure them. But, I understand what you're thinking, Rimuru said, addressing the merchants' concerns about trading with monsters and following human rules. Despite offering compromises like bartering goods or using ancient coins, the merchants rejected them. Rimuru, feeling betrayed by their lack of trust, declared that they wouldn't be allowed to conduct business in their nation anymore, although they could still enter. This announcement shocked the merchants, especially Duke Muse, who protested, citing their rights under international law. Rimuru clarified that their nation wasn't part of the Council of the West yet and expressed determination to establish a new economic bloc centered around their land. This decision left Duke Mew stunned, realizing his failure to win their trust or join their economic plans. What nonsense are you spouting? Such arrogance! protested Duke Muse, but Rimuru remained firm, emphasizing teamwork and the pursuit of shared goals. Rimuru expressed a desire for equal footing with the Council of the West but asserted that if they were to be kept down, they could work through the Free Guild instead. Despite misunderstandings, Duke Muse offered to serve as an intermediary, but Rimuru declined, citing his loss of credibility. Rimuru then hinted at the forthcoming media coverage of the payment struggle during the Founders' Festival, leaving Duke Muse visibly distressed about the potential fallout. In the end, we had stubborn merchants demanding payment only in dwarven gold coins and then Duke Muse stepped in to support them, even though he wasn't directly involved. If someone read the newspaper article about this, what would they think? queried Rimuru, causing Duke Muse to falter. It was Diablo who orchestrated the gathering of reporters, revealing the details of the situation to justify the nation's actions. Rimuru believed in the power of factual information over fabrication, and acknowledged Gazel and Amija's contributions to the strategy. Dismissing Duke Muse, Rimuru entrusted Miramai with the nation's finances, leaving the merchants desperate and the reporters intrigued. Exiting the room with his staff, Rimuru quietly expressed gratitude to Miyurama, considering him for a higher role. As Miyurama addressed the merchants for the final time, Rimuru reflected on the resolution of the event. After chasing the Duke away, we gathered for our usual review meeting in the Standard Hall, not the fancy one used for festival events. Among those present were Gezel, Elmisha, Yom and his crew, Fuse, and even Yuki, Hinata, and Masayuki, along with a few other special guests I invited, Milim and the Demon Lord group weren't included to keep things focused. Veldora, sulking in a corner, seemed ready to interject about the lack of challengers. Trying to steer clear of his distractions, I kicked off the meeting with gratitude for everyone's assistance. Binimaru surprisingly kicked off the discussion, expressing shock at my stern punishment of the merchants. Rigard and others echoed similar sentiments. Gazel, intrigued, inquired about my handling of the situation. I recounted the events, and though Gazel found it drastic, he didn't express anger, understanding my perspective. Balmija, as perceptive as ever, praised my retaliation strategy. When Benimaru asked about future plans, I reiterated my desire for equal footing with the Council of the West and my readiness to follow their rules while asserting our stance. Brigard acknowledged our preparedness for a patient process but noted that rejecting Duke Muse was a message for them to send a high-ranking envoy if they wished to continue negotiations. Listening to what Gazel said, Rimuru nodded along. He thought Gazel made sense, especially when he said that the others wouldn't want to look like enemies, especially after their failed trick. Rimuru sounded pretty sure about their strength and the chance for more talks later on. Gizel's words seemed to make Rimuru feel even more confident about their plan. 
When Diablo suggested jumping into action, Rimuru hesitated, saying they shouldn't make things worse for no reason. Xian stepped in and calmed Diablo down, letting Rimuru stress the importance of being patient and friendly with the Western nations. Even though Diablo was excited, Rimuru kept insisting on being peaceful rather than aggressive. That seemed to convince everyone. They were all busy with improving their own country, so the first thing they needed to focus on was building a strong economic group for themselves. Amisha pointed out that their opponents would have no choice but to negotiate, although she sympathized with them a bit, knowing it's tough to negotiate with someone who isn't afraid of economic or military threats. Geld wondered why Rimuru was so harsh on the individual merchants, but before Rimuru could explain, Mirama stepped in with a big smile, saying they needed to fight back when someone attacked them. He explained that Rimuru wanted to make those merchants indebted to them to turn them into allies. Following Amiya's advice, Rimuru used a mix of persuasion and intimidation to achieve this. Mirama succeeded in winning them over, making them all indebted to Rimuru. While Rimuru was glad for the success, he didn't like being portrayed as a mob boss. With everyone understanding his reasoning, they moved on to the next topic. The next topic, or rather the main one, was about discussing their thoughts on the Founders Festival. Rimuru invited everyone to share their feedback, prompting Gezel to express his concerns about Rimuru's actions during the festival. Gezel was troubled by the sudden introduction of advanced technology, particularly the projector developed by Vester and Gobble, which incorporated Clayman's magical image recording items. While Rimuru saw it as a useful invention for entertainment, Gezel and the other leaders perceived it as a potential game-changer in warfare. Gezel wished Rimuru had informed him beforehand about such a significant development, highlighting the cultural shock it caused among the audience. Vaughn and Dolph chimed in, emphasizing the technology's implications for future conflicts. Overall, Rimuru realized that what seemed ordinary to him had profound implications for others, especially in the political arena. It turned out that the projector technology had significant military applications, such as remote command of armies and improved reconnaissance. Rimuru and Gezel both regretted not discussing it earlier, realizing its potential to revolutionize warfare. Rimuru explained that the technology required powerful magic and had limited availability, attempting to downplay its immediate impact. Gezel cautioned against presenting such impactful inventions without consideration. Almizia expressed interest in acquiring similar inventions through a patent system, while Alen and Almizia engaged in a friendly conversation, surprising Alen's father with their familiarity. Majesty, please refrain from spoiling Alen and Alen address a majesty properly, Gezel interjected sternly. The banter between Elen and Elmesia revealed their close bond, which transcended social hierarchies. Elmesia's request for engineers from Tempest highlighted the potential collaboration between the nations with Elmesia offering to compensate for their guidance. Rimuru considered the logistics, pondering whether to export parts or manufacture them locally. Elmesia's suggestion to use the train system for transportation aligned with Rimuru's thoughts, prompting him to contemplate the implications of her offer while remaining cautious about her apparent insight into his plans. We haven't made a train yet, but we're working on it. Maybe your experts can help, Elmisha suggested eagerly. Arald quickly agreed to relay the message, displaying unwavering loyalty to her. Gazel observed their interaction, perhaps considering his own relationship with Elmisha. With the prospect of collaborating with Thalion, Rimuru envisioned a technology-sharing agreement and joint research efforts. Combining Thalion's sorcerer science and Dwargan's elemental engineering, they aim to connect distant lands with magic trains. The upcoming assistance from the Overcomers provided another potential resource. Rimuru outlined his vision for magic trains, sparking excitement from Elmija and a more reserved response from Gazel. Despite Gazel's reservations, his supportive demeanor suggested confidence in Rimuru's abilities. Elmija's enthusiasm contrasted with Arald's subdued demeanor, reflecting the potential for accelerated development through their collaboration. Rimuru proposed starting with laying rails to Thalion alongside highway construction streamlining the process. If they took charge of the project, Rimuru believed they could ensure everything followed the same standards. Initially, completing the rail network seemed feasible until Mamaji brought up the idea of needing a tunnel, which caught Rimuru off guard. By explaining their plan to connect Blumen, Farmanus, and Dwargan before reaching Thalion, Rimuru expressed concerns about acquiring land rights in the Western nations. Mamaji agreed to allow the tunnel construction if it didn't harm their mountains, but she requested Benimaru oversee it, Causing some embarrassment, Rimuru assured Mamaji that Benimaru's leadership skills were needed, despite Benimaru's protests about his lack of construction knowledge. Realizing the plan was unrealistic and not wanting to send Benimaru away for too long, Rimuru abandoned the idea of involving him in the project. Well, sorry, but Benimaru is important here. Maybe he can come along when they check on things, but they want him to visit their lands too. Mamaji seemed happy with that and Akira seemed pleased too. 
they asked Benimaru if he was giving in, but he just said he'd be a bodyguard during the inspections. Momiji said that was okay. Then they talked about doing some checking to see if they could build a tunnel. Momiji said go ahead, and they could start digging if everything looked good. The others also talked about doing similar work in their own places. Homija said sure, and asked someone else to handle the details. Arao looked more and more tired as time went on. He was working for a really relaxed leader, which was nice, but he always had his own conditions for everything. That might have made things tricky for him, but I didn't mind, so I agreed. We promised to help if there were any problems. The meeting started as just a review, but we ended up making a lot of important decisions thanks to the leaders there, especially Omija. Yom, who hadn't said much, finally spoke up, asking if he could get some help explaining something from Muron. She stood up, apologizing for not being around much, then they talked about a highway project and something called the Monster and Man Cooperative Alliance. They liked the idea of the Monster and Man Cooperative Alliance. It meant monsters and humans working together for everyone's benefit. Our nation, Tempest was at the center, with Dwarkon to the east, Brumund to the west, and Milim's domain to the south, along with Brumund, Farminus up north, and Thalion down south. They formed a big team. If they all worked together it could be great. They talked about launching a new project to help, focusing on agriculture. But everything seemed to be going well already. Diablo had convinced the nobles to cooperate, and Yom had a lot of support from the people. The military's role was clear, and the nation was united. It seemed like the main job now was making sure everything ran smoothly. Rimuru was impressed by Muron's capabilities, noting her suggestion to assist with rail lane work for transporting crops. Reflecting on past trade practices, Rimuru highlighted the need for the nation to handle food transportation efficiently. He introduced the concept of magic trains surprising everyone with their speed and capacity. Planning ahead, Rimuru discussed purchasing land and straightening rail lines for optimal efficiency. He delegated surveying tasks to guild staff and the local beastmen, while entrusting Muron with organizing the workers under their command. Rimuru felt the surge of excitement as Muron eagerly offered her support, ensuring a smooth collaboration with Farminus. Fuse, who had been quiet amidst the festival's festivities, finally introduced himself and brought in the Baron of Variad, known for his diligent work ethic. Variad, representing King Doram of Brumund, gracefully addressed the audience, seeking permission to ask a question. Despite the presence of the king and queen, who seemed unassuming, the gathering was functioning like an official conference. Rinmuru noted King Doram's friendly demeanor, uncertain if it suited the occasion. Variard stepped forward, expressing interest in Rimuru's plans for Blumund's future role in the world. He acknowledged Rimuru's vision of Blumund becoming a logistics hub, especially with the introduction of magic trains. Variard proposed Blumund overseeing goods and managing deficiencies in other nations offering their support. Rimuru appreciated Variard's insight and questioned if Blumund could handle such responsibilities. Variard assured their willingness to adapt and invest in education for the future. Impressed by Variard's foresight, Rimuru recognized the impending paradigm shift and entrusted Blumund with logistical tasks, praising their expertise in gathering and analyzing information. Though surprised by Variard's negotiation skills, Rimuru welcomed his cooperation. The meeting, initially intended as a festival review, transformed into a strategic political discussion, freeing Rimuru from potential negotiations with Bumand and prompting him to focus on supporting Variad's initiatives. After discussing important matters about running their nations, it was time to focus on the festival. Rimuru prepared to listen to feedback when Veldora suddenly stood up, upset about the unexplored labyrinth's hundredth floor. Rimuru tried to explain but Veldora remained adamant, recalling his prepared lines for the challenge. Rimuru knew arguing with Veldora wouldn't help, so he acknowledged the need to address the issue, considering the adventurer's varying skill levels. Cabal's party, known for looting treasure chests, sighed in disappointment, while Masaki unintentionally boasted about his group's easy victory on the 10th floor. Rimuru reassured Veldora that no challenges would come knocking on his door for a while. For Veldora, the lack of visitors to the labyrinth was disappointing, questioning the effort they put in. Molly reassured him, explaining that the unveiling of the labyrinth footage attracted interest from various nations, especially due to the rare items. After discussing important matters about running their nations, it was time to focus on the festival. Rimuru prepared to listen to feedback when, Veldora suddenly stood up, upset about the unexplored labyrinth's hundredth floor. Rimuru tried to explain but Veldora remained adamant, recalling his prepared lines for the challenge. Rimuru knew arguing with Veldora wouldn't help, so he acknowledged the need to address the issue, considering the adventurer's varying skill levels. Cabal's party, known for looting treasure chests, sighed in disappointment, while Masoki unintentionally boasted about his group's easy victory on the 10th floor. 
we Marui assured Veldora that no challenges would come knocking on his door for a while. For Veldora, the lack of visitors to the labyrinth was disappointing. Questioning the effort they put in, Molly reassured him, explaining that the unveiling of the labyrinth footage attracted interest from various nations, especially due to the rare items found in treasure chests. He suggested that nobles would send adventurers into the labyrinth to collect treasures as they often hide them for protection. Additionally, Molly planned to introduce a bounty system, offering a large sum of money to anyone who conquered the dungeon, which would attract adventurers and support from wealthy patrons. Molly envisioned it as a sponsorship opportunity where successful adventurers would boost their patrons' reputation and potentially earn them more money. Overall, Molly had grand plans to make the labyrinth a lucrative venture for adventurers and nobles alike. It sounded like broadcasting labyrinth runs to the Colosseum seats could be a lot of fun. Molly's idea of sponsors for adventurers impressed Rimuru, showing his insight into the future. Rimuru admired how sponsors would love to see adventurers achieve big victories. With everyone's attention captured, Molly and Rimuru had one more thing to discuss with the Free Guild. Molly proposed that the guild manage the bounty prizes for the labyrinth, which piqued Yuki Kagerzaka's interest. Yuki wanted to know why they were making this offer. The proposal to have the Free Guild manage the bounty prizes for the labyrinth was mainly for advertising and efficiently managing challenges through membership cards. Yuki Kagerzaka, impressed by the idea, considered its benefits for the guild, especially with fewer monster hunting opportunities expected in the future due to Rimuru's management of the Forest of Jura. Instead, the labyrinth would provide a steady supply of monsters for adventurers to hunt, generating profits for the guild through the sale of monster parts and taxes. Seeing the potential for creating new job opportunities for out-of-work adventurers, Yuki expressed interest in the idea, suggesting the establishment of a new guild location in town. Pleased with the outcome, Rimuru and Miramel finalized their deal with the Free Guild. Rimuru discussed the potential increase in adventures with Veldora, anticipating their growth in skills over the next few years in the labyrinth. Veldora, seemingly excited, looked forward to the prospect. However, Hinata raised a concern about safety measures for adventurers transitioning between the labyrinth and the outside world. Rimuru felt unsure about how to address this, but Hinata insisted it was a serious issue. She proposed a suggestion to address the safety concerns, stating it could benefit both of them. Rimuru, feeling tense, agreed to listen to her suggestion, curious about what she had in mind. Hinata proposed sending priests from the Western Holy Church to the Labyrinth to improve their skills and preserve their knowledge of holy magic, including the rare ability of resurrection. Despite initial shock from others, Rimuru understood the importance of this initiative. With fewer opportunities to practice their skills in times of peace, Hinata saw the Labyrinth as a valuable training ground. Rimuru agreed, recognizing the benefits of having priests with advanced healing abilities to enhance safety outside the labyrinth. This collaboration also offered Rimuru the opportunity to study and learn more about the secret skills of faith and favor, mentioned by Luminous. Thus, an agreement was reached, and priests were welcomed to the labyrinth. Just when Rimuru thought the meeting was over, Hinata had another suggestion. She proposed having the paladins undergo labyrinth training as part of their regimen. Rimuru was surprised, but Hinata explained her idea, grouping new recruits in parties of five or six to enter the labyrinth for practical training. This would not only enhance their field skills but also benefit the priests. Rimuru redirected the conversation back to this topic, and Hinata elaborated, mentioning that high-level paladins could likely reach floor 50 already. Despite the diversion caused by Veldora's Takoyaki stand, they focused on the training plan, which seemed promising for improving the skills of their recruits. Veldora enthusiastically agreed to Anata's proposal of having the paladins undergo labyrinth training, expressing confidence in their abilities. Anata insisted that even the captain should join, asserting that the labyrinth was a safe yet effective training ground. Arnaud and Bacchus, however, were skeptical and protested, boasting about their strength as crusaders. Anata challenged them to prove their prowess by conquering the labyrinth, crushing their arguments. Despite the realization that Veldora guarded the hundredth floor, they had no choice but to accept Anata's request much to Rimuru's approval. With most of the meeting's agenda address, Rimuru took the opportunity to discuss his concerns about the merchants from the Eastern Lands, suspecting they might be up to something. Henrietta, the head of Dworkin's intelligence agency, assured him that they were under surveillance and not causing any trouble. Likewise, Elmisha's closed borders kept them at bay, ensuring the safety of the kingdom. Rimuru's main worry was for Farminus, which was now under Yon's leadership. However, Diablo had already handled the situation by examining the account books, severing ties with any suspicious merchants. Rimuru decided to leave decisions regarding the free guild to each office, acknowledging their autonomy in such matters. 
Wimuru was aware that not all Eastern merchants were part of any government schemes, some were just ordinary traders. Ordering the guild headquarters to sever all ties with them wasn't practical as it would affect their members' livelihoods. Instead, Yuuki promised to provide guidance to regional bases. Surprisingly, Hinata revealed that the Holy Empire of Rubilius had ceased all business with Eastern merchants due to an incident involving a merchant named Amrata, who attempted to deceive her. This raised suspicions about a potential connection between Demrata and an intruder who had trespassed into Rubilius during the Walpurgis night. Rimuru concluded that they needed to remain vigilant against Eastern activity, and officially ended the meeting, ensuring that everyone was on the same page. Now, only Rimuru's own team remained in a meeting hall. Binimaru asked Rimuru if he had reached a conclusion. Rimuru confirmed believing that the mysterious patron mentioned by Clayman was Yuuki Kagurizaka. Diablo also agreed, removing any doubts. Rimuru had become certain after receiving advice from Luminous. While he reserved judgment on another woman, he was suspicious of Yuuki. He discovered that only a few people knew about his past with Shizu, and Hinata learned it from an Eastern merchant. Additionally, M. Jaren revealed that she was unfamiliar with the moderate Chester's implying Clayman kept them secret. Shuna's investigation revealed connections between Clayman and Eastern merchants, and Adaman saw the jesters near Clayman's place. Rimuru concluded that the jesters and Eastern merchants were likely connected supported by Diablo's insight. They speculated that Laplace, if Edson from the battle, might have been the one who killed Roy. Among the three jesters Rimuru knew, Footman and Ter were occupied in the battle against Clayman, eliminating potential traitors. The third jester was suspected to be infiltrating Nubilius. Rimuru reasoned that since everyone aware of his relationship with Shizu was at the meeting, the leak must have come from someone against him. After ruling out several individuals, Yuuki remained the prime suspect due to his ties to eastern merchants. Rimuru had initially suspected Kabul's group but dismissed it, considering Ilen's supportive role and Amisha's backing. He concluded that the eastern merchants aimed to expand their influence in the western nations, potentially causing a conflict between Rimuru and Hinata orchestrated by them. Yes, it's clear they didn't care who got hurt, agreed Benimaru and Diablo. Rimuru speculated that the eastern merchants were aiming to influence both the council and the church in the western nations, possibly with the free guild's cooperation. Without concrete evidence, Rimuru opted for cautious observation rather than immediate action. He instructed his staff to keep an eye on Yuki and refrain from unauthorized moves. Despite wanting to confront Yuki immediately, Rimuru acknowledged the importance of presumed innocence until guilt was proven. As normal life resumed after the festival, Rimuru braced for the looming confrontation with Yuki, aware of the intricate game of wits that awaited them. Duke Mew stumbled overwhelmed by fear and despair. He had underestimated Demon Lord Rimuru's power hoping to manipulate him into owing a favor, but found himself outmatched. Reflecting on the merchant's plight, he realized they faced even worse consequences. Rimuru's thorough knowledge of their backgrounds and goods applied immense pressure, hinting at the economic dominance of his domain. Witnessing the cultural richness at the Founders' Festival humbled Mew's, prompting regret for his past arrogance. Facing potential ruin, he knew there was no escaping the scrutiny of the Russell family, leaving him with no choice but to face the truth and its consequences. Grandfather Brandle regretted not heeding Marable's warnings about Tempest's significance, realizing their missed opportunity. Marable, embodying the Russell family's ambition, felt compelled to take matters into her own hands to rectify the situation. Despite Grandel's reluctance to send her alone, Marable reassured him of her capability and determination. With her declaration of greed and ambition, Marable embarked on her own course of action. One month later, a letter arrived from the Council of the West, signaling the consequences of their decisions. That's it for today guys, and thank for watching the video, stay tuned for next chapter. Until then, goodbye.